This is Jocko Podcast number 146 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And I wanted to kind of delve into and slash explain some conversations that I've had lately sure. with a couple of people. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think the numbers increased now because now I've had this conversation with a few people. And I'm, I am feeling like I need to kind of share this idea with kind of with more people, I guess, at this point. It's kind of a discussion that applies to everyone at some level, sort of about what you are and about who you are and about where you've been and about where you're going. So that's a pretty broad topic. I think it suffice it to say. Yeah. Now, in order to convey this properly, I'm going to try and set up some visuals in your head because you got to kind of see this, mm-hmm. right? Graphs, whatever, charts, sure. all right? Diagrams. Diagrams. And I'm going to try and keep them simple, but pretty straightforward. Um, here we go. We're going to grade things. We're going to grade things one to ten because that's sort of the stand. Is that the standard? Yes. I mean, I, I guess so. you go A, B, C, D, F. Yeah, but but we're not doing that. Yeah. We're going one to ten. One being the worst, ten being the best. Mm-hmm. One being the least, ten being the most. That type of thing. Okay. Yes. So so you have a chart picture in your head. At the bottom of the chart is a one. That's the lowest. That's the worst. At the top is ten. That's the highest. That's the most. Now, the first chart that we're going to talk about. It measures talent. Yes. Now, what's different about this chart is this is not just talking about a particular talent. This is talking about every possible type of talent that you as an individual human being have. And it's consolidating that all those different types of talents into one giant score. One holistic score. Ten at the top or one at the bottom. So this is, this is everything. That you are as a person, how smart you are. The, the only, the only thing is everything you are as a person that you are given naturally, right? Yeah. So there's a baseline of how smart you are. So how intelligent you are. Now we know you can work to get smarter, but we're just talking the baseline. How, how charismatic you are as a person. How well you read people's emotions. How athletic you are. And that grades, you can grade all different types of athleticism in there, what strength, because some people are naturally strong, some people are naturally flexible, some people have natural cardiovascular endurance, right? You get a certain level of that naturally. Of course, Mm -hmm. we know people can work hard, you can improve some of that, Mm -hmm. but we're just talking your natural talent. Healthy, that's sort of a talent, sort of like some people are born healthier than others. No doubt about it. How good looking you are. You ever seen those little like I don't know if they're psychological experiments, but they put like the faces in front yeah. of the babies, and yeah. like the babies pick the 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 one that looks nicer to them. Yeah. It has to do with uh, yeah, symmetry. Yeah, symmetry, 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 and, and, and ratios, ratios and yeah. stuff like this. So, so that that's a talent thing that you're getting, and natural your natural body composition, right? Some people are born a little bit with a little bit more fat on them. Some people are born with a little bit more muscle on them. Some people are born with Skin and bones, right? You get everything. Yeah. Again, I know you can work on some of those, but we're talking about what you got out of the gate from your creator or nature or wherever you think you got it from. Yeah. So, at the top of that chart, I don't know who's at the top of that chart. Uh, maybe, I mean, there's people. There's there's a bunch of people that would rank towards the top of that chart. Mm-hmm. So, who's up there? Well, yeah, ultimately hard to tell because you don't know what you don't know what was given to them or what's worked for. True, but you true, know, to point. look at them, you know, to and just kinda judge assess a someone as a whole. Yeah, I don't know, like a the Rock char- type character, <laughs> Boom, Dwayne Johnson. The Rock. You he's know? charismatic. He's a good athlete. Really tall. good athlete. He's tall. Yeah, kinda he's kinda. he's got a good acting skill. Which I'm, again, did he work hard for these things? We better t- we better give the Rock some credit, yeah. or we're gonna hear from him. I worked for all that. Yeah. But hey, he's given some natural stuff. Good. That's a very good one. Uh, Tom Brady, right? Yes. He's smart. He's a good athlete. He's, you know, got some leadership skills. So he's got some, 
some some natural gifts that, again does he work hard we're not taking that away from him yeah. but you're born with some stuff GSP maybe right yeah, GSP maybe. really good athlete smart guy you know level-headed yeah. you know just a, he's a very talented guy yeah. so there you go you take that chart you look at that chart the one to ten where's the where those where's the rock he's like a 9.6 he's up there yeah and then you ask yourself, where are you on that chart? Where are you on that chart? And I've asked quite a few people this. And we're still talking naturally. We're just talking what Natural. you okay. got naturally. Gotcha. Where do you think most people, where would you rank yourself? Naturally, yep. f- I don't know, five. Oh, most people rank themselves, most people that I've asked have ranked themselves a little bit higher than that. They've ranked themselves 6.8, 7.2. In that, they're giving themselves a little bit above average, right? Yeah. You're going five, huh? Well, keep in mind, we just said The Rock. So I'm like, all mm. right. you know. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know what we should have done is we should have said one to 100. So you could say The Rock is a 96. I'd still be a 50. Okay, <laughs> Same cool. Same kind of deal. Cool. Yeah. All right, so you're giving yourself five. So, so yeah, I'll that, that's, that's good. And I'm sure you know we could break that down about where you got the... Because some people, this is important, some people can be a... 10 or a 9.8 for their intellect but maybe they socially don't have good skills about reading they weren't born with that little thing right so they can't read people well so even though they're really smart they're not they're not making anything happen because they can't even communicate with people well or they're just they're not healthy right they're bad athletes some people the opposite wicked good athlete but they're just not that smart Mm. right and everything but so you could you could be a nine athlete but you're a a very low whatever intellect and that's gonna bring you down might even be, bring you down below average so mm. so you got that chart and that's it okay so now we got that it's the holistic talent chart that's what we'll call it we got the holistic talent chart on one side mm-hmm. now in your head I want you to picture on the other side the other side is another chart also 1 to 10 1 being the least 10 being the most and this chart is to grade success. Now, this is not easy to do because, of course, you can ask yourself, what is success, right? What is really being successful? And this is a good question. And I remember, I don't know if you remember this, I, when people started asking me a lot about my how to raise your kids, and I said, well, I don't want to talk about how to raise kids because I don't know if I'm a success. I don't know if my kids are successful. I don't know if I should be giving that advice. Yeah. Because what if my kids aren't successful? Yeah. And and when then when you when I started talking about that question, it's like, okay, what are if my kid if one of my kids goes and get a job at an investment bank and is making four hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year as a twenty six year old, is that successful? It could be, but what if that kid is miserable? What if that kid you know, is is doing cocaine, right? Yeah. That's not successful. That's horrible. So it's very hard to so that, that makes you start thinking about what is success. But I think we can generally know and understand what success broadly is when you look at these individual categories. Yeah. Right? So okay. Good family, right? You've got a good stable Scenario going on with your family if you're old enough to have a family if you're not old enough to have family At least you are prepared to have a good family life that type of thing. That's one level of success Uh, a gratifying job Meaning a job that because you can I know people that make a ton of money in their job and they hate it. Yes, right? So is that successful? Mm, Maybe not I know people that love their job, but they don't make any money and they're struggling paycheck to paycheck. Does that is that success? Mm, I don't know. Again, these are all things we could kind of weigh out. Yeah. And then you've got health and wellness because even though we talked about what you're given naturally, you got to remember that you think you can work for something, yeah. and you can you can be successful and be healthy and be mobile and be not worried about getting out of breath when you walk up the stairs or whatever. So the overall health and wellness. And so again, you have to take all these different types of success, all of them, and wrap them up holistically. And I don't know, could we throw, and this might be the wrong, you could possibly throw, kind of a strange, you could possibly throw just the whole word happiness onto the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Just the, the general 
term happiness where I, I but I think that's a scary thing to do yeah. because happiness isn't necessarily a good thing in terms of you meet someone that's had a few beverages and even though their life's a disaster man they're having a good time at the bar they're pretty happy right. is, this, is this our goal not really that's why I think happiness is a I don't know that I would throw it into this chart I would call it success because it has a little bit more strength to it mm. <sighs> now you got your two you got your two your two charts now mm. on the left you have holistic talent is that what I called it yes holistic talent. holistic talent on the left on the right you have holistic success success yeah. now here's the question and I could ask you where you are on the success side yeah where are you oh. seven oh okay good good so you were a five for talent and you're a seven for success that's pretty that's pretty legit let me ask you this is every person that is at the top of the talent chart holistically with everything they've got is every one of those people that scores a 9.8 at the top of the success chart Negative. and the answer is no mm. the answer is no is every person that's on the bottom of the talent holistic talent chart on the bottom of the success chart no the answer is no and what do we see we see that there's a well, when you put the space in between these two, there's talent, holistic talent, and there's holistic success. And there's a space in between. And that's what actually matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what actually matters. What do you do? What do you do? The thi And I, to me, and I hate to get, I hate to throw this out there, mm -hmm. but for me, the thing that's in between the left and the right, the thing that's in between talent and success is, is, can be summed up in one word, discipline. Discipline, do you have the discipline to do the work, to make the hard decisions, to put in the daily grind that's gonna get you from wherever you, you started out with whatever level of talent you had and move yourself up that chart on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to recognize this and this conversation this particular conversation the first time I had it was with a younger person who I could see in their eyes had the sense of like I don't know if I have the talent hmm. and it's like well you know I don't know if you have the talent either there's one way to find out you do the hard work you implement discipline mm -hmm. on your life and that will give you the opportunity to see how far up that success. One thing I can tell you is if you don't have the discipline and you don't do the work, you're not gonna be above your your holistic talent level at all. Yeah. There's some people that make a run for it, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's some people that have no talent or very limited talent, yeah. but they get after it, and yeah. they end up way off far on the success. And you know what I think is good about this? When you get some success, you kind of compound that back into your hard work and people start to get on an upward spiral, upward mobility towards the top of the success chart because they got a little foothold. Once yeah. they got that foothold, it felt good. Then they take another step, they get a little bit further and yeah. then they get a little, a little bit more success, boom. And yeah. then they use that to propel themselves up a little higher. The yeah. problem is the reverse happens as well. Yeah. That's the problem. People feel a little bit of, they got beat at something. Right. The, the, the bad luck came their way. Because you know what? On this in between there's some luck in, in between the discipline there's absolutely some luck as well yeah. there's some luck and you can get lucky you can meet the right person at the right time you can you can make a move at the right time before anyone else did you can you can get discovered by someone or something you, you know there's there's definitely some luck involved for sure you can't count on the luck the luck is not the reason some people like to look at someone else and say they're lucky they didn't see the, the the thousands and thousands of hours of hard work that person put in. Yeah. They just saw that last little end result where they got lucky, allegedly. Yeah. Yeah, the luck thing is is weird because if you kind of extrapolate it out, like someone who, okay, when I played football, we had to do these cool shirts. 
And they'd say something on the back or the front. I don't know. Whatever. Oh, and it says chance favors. One of them said chance favors the prepared man. Right? True. So it's like same thing, right? Chance and luck, same thing. So you'll like the more prepared you are, yes. the more skills you have, the, the more whatever, you, the quote unquote luck you're going to get. But really, when you fit, uh, switch the word luck for chance, you just increase your chances of success. True. So like, um, you know, I don't know who got discovered. You know, mm-hmm. he, they're, they're going to be in a position to be discovered, yeah. you know, because whoever, quote unquote, discovered them, I'm sure many people have been in that situation, too. You know, like, um, you know, you know, some guy goes on the news, right, mm-hmm. with his baskets that he makes, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And boom, he blows up because those baskets are dope. Yeah. But bro, plenty of people have been on the news with yeah. their thing, you know, yeah. for years, decades, centuries, maybe, mm-hmm. well, maybe not centuries, but, you know. No, for like, no TV <laughs> centuries ago. <laughs> <laughs> people have been going on the news with their thing for a long time yeah same thing with American Idol a lot of people have been on American oh, Idol yeah 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 you see what I'm saying how many and, people really made it right you know as far as getting discovered or whatever it's like oh yeah you got lucky or whatever yeah man but you're not gonna get lucky if you're if you're kind of whack, you know. Mm. Like if you're t- if you're not prepared, if you're you don't have the skill, you don't have the ta- talent, you don't have the X Y Z that it takes. Then yeah, so it's kind of like yeah, the luck is sprinkled in there everywhere. Right, by the right. way, you know, and and maybe they didn't get discovered on the news, but maybe they went to somewhere else and then got discovered, you know, a year, two years later or whatever, you know. So you just increase the probability of being discovered when you have the skill. So yeah, luck, sure, it is part of it. 100%. It is, it is a thing for sure. But yeah. It can propel you a little bit faster sometimes. Yeah, but it's it's like one of those things where you talk like a foothold, right? Mm-hmm. There's a bunch of s- s- footholds everywhere. Mm-hmm. Just because someone latched on to one specific one that everyone wants to point to and say he got lucky there. Mm-hmm. Well, he's so good or she's so good most of the time. Most of the time. There's exceptions everywhere, obviously. But most of the time, that person's so good, they would have got discovered somewhere else anyway. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of, oh, this particular one made them get discovered and propelled them all quick or whatever. Yeah. You know? Well, this ties back into something that I've said before and I'll say it again right now is make your luck yeah you, you got to make your luck and if you make it if you keep if you keep putting forth the maximal effort that luck's gonna come you're gonna make your luck happen yeah. you know that you know that actually when we when we came when task unit bruiser came home from Iraq there was there was you know people were like oh you guys got super lucky on that deployment because we got a lot of action right mm-hmm. and there was two like immediate thoughts behind that was number one like hey you know first of all we lost our bros like they're nothing lucky about that was the first immediate thought in my head it was like hey man like because because the bottom line is seals want to go into combat mm. bad and that's just a broad statement and so when we came home had been in a lot of combat and killed a lot of bad guys and people were kind of saying hey you guys got lucky right. and and again the first thought was hey man you, you if this is luck i don't want it the second thought was just like the same thing like oh we got lucky we didn't like crush ourselves in the work up and try and be the most you know prepared we could be and then yeah. get overseas and then form relationships with all the conventional forces and do good work for them and continue to you know just get go as hard as we could the whole time no that didn't have anything to do with it it was just luck and it kind of yeah. fell into our lap yeah. but you know of course just nod your head and say thanks man appreciate yeah. it yeah good times yeah. uh, so luck is definitely a part of it a little part because were we was I lucky to be in Ramadi? Because I could have deployed a year later, and a year later Ramadi was pacified. So is there luck there? There absolutely is. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to sound arrogant, right. but luck is a part. That's it's true. like foot locks. It's like heel hooks. Sure, they're a part of the game. Yeah. They're not a game changer. Right. They're they're a part of the game. They're not a game changer. We we had a group come in. This is back in the day. Back in the day, <laughs> mm-hmm. a group came in. A guys that were known for foot locking and heel hooking and what they didn't they thought we were jiu-jitsu guys normal jiu-jitsu guys but we weren't because we were it's dean right mm-hmm. so we were foot locking heel hooking all the time mm-hmm. and these guys came in and immediately they were going for these are the kind of guys that would go and i don't know if you i don't know if you remember this time period in jiu-jitsu it was like immediate they're going for a foot lock like just diving for it yeah but they didn't know that we did footlocks all the time and you weren't gonna just grab a footlock on right. Dean Lister or me. 
Yeah. Like that just wasn't gonna happen. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, it, then all of a sudden they didn't have the rest of jujitsu. Didn't yeah. have the rest of the game. So yeah. then it was not good for them yeah. because they only had this one dimensional game. And that's what taught me that foot locks are important but they're not more important than a choke or a guard pass. Yep. They are definitely part of the game. You can't leave out, but they're not a game changer. And you see that now, now that you see everyone broadly getting good at at the whole leg locking, foot locking, heel hooking game, now you see it coming back around where you have to have the rest of jujitsu as well. Yeah. Like even, even as much as like a year ago, it was like, oh, this guy got this crazy heel hook and the guy tapped and he didn't know what was happening. Mm-hmm. That very rapidly changes into okay. The guy went for a heel hook. The other guy got out. Now we got to where are we back to? We're back to the jiu yeah, yeah. So, same thing. Luck is a factor. It's not the factor. Yeah. All right. Now that's number one. This is the number one thing I wanted to talk about today. If you're in that position where you're looking at your talent, and I guess this is, I guess it's applicable to people that are a little bit younger because people that are a little bit older, they probably figured this out already. You probably looked at yourself in the mirror and said, "Hey, look, I I might not have that much talent, but I can I can I can get after it." You know, this is something they used to say about basketball too. And I don't I don't I know you weren't a basketball player. I played basketball growing up, mm-hmm. and when I was growing up, it was like the heyday of the Lakers and the Celtics rivalry and all this. Sure. Hell yeah. Well, the hard work, right? Just this, like, hey, I'm gonna work harder than anyone else to make up for my lack of talent. Yeah. And they would say about Larry Bird, you know who Larry Bird is? Yes. They would say, this is kind of garbage. They'd say Larry Bird wasn't athletic, mm-hmm. which is total garbage. I mean, yeah. but people would say that. And maybe it's because he didn't have the the biggest vertical jump or whatever. And they'd say he was like slower than other players. Mm-hmm. But he worked so hard that he was able to compensate for that. Now again... When I heard that when I was a kid, I kind of believed it. When you see Larry Bird now, when I watched, you know, games, he was he's a freaking awesome athlete. You yeah. know, and you're not playing in the NBA and being a world champion over and over again, MVP, right. without being an awesome athlete. No. How that tall was, was Larry Bird? By how the way? old is he? How tall? He was, oh, he's like yeah. six eight. Yeah, tall guy. I remember yeah, yeah, this yeah. guy named Spud Webb who was yeah. like five something. Yeah, yeah, you know? Spud so, Webb for sure. You know, there is that. But yeah, yeah, man, I dig it. I remember this. Dude, Spud sure. Webb probably had to work harder to make. What about there's a guy named. I think his name was Muggsy Bogues. Muggsy Bogues. You remember Same Muggsy deal. Bogues? Yeah. He was now he was even smaller than Spud Webb. No sure. But he was so small that people it was a different little situation that the players had to deal with. He was so small and so so fast. You know what's interesting? I got some friends in hockey. And as a matter of fact, the goals, you know the goals? The goals. The San Diego goals. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. It's like, got it. So I went down and talked to the goals. <laughs> and what's cool about what's cool about that level of athletics? which is the minor leagues, the goals are a minor league team. What's cool about that level of athletics is those guys are st- hungry. Yeah. They're, they're not prima donnas that are, you know, p- p- driving around in a chauffeured car and all that stuff. These guys are hungry mm-hmm. and they're playing hard. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is in hockey, and this is within the last few years, at one point a few years ago, they were just getting the bigger and bigger and bigger hockey players just getting bigger guys because you just they're yeah. just monster guys that are six six and six five and six four and they weigh a you know 260 mm. and that was the way hockey was going but then what happened was they started bringing out these guys that were smaller and faster yeah and that could go maneuver quicker than the bigger guys and all of a sudden hockey's going back in that direction of smaller faster guys mm. So, it's interesting. And the amount of talent that that employs, hey, figure it out. Mm-hmm. You can make something happen. Muggsy Bogues, Spud Webb, make it happen. Make it happen. Regardless of height. But to my point, Larry Bird, when I was a kid, I would hear about Larry Bird not being a good athlete. Mm-hmm. And all you had to do was work hard. Which which left an impression on me as a kid. Hey, look, Larry Bird's not that he's not that great athlete, but he's gonna work hard. Yeah. So that's what I'm gonna do. Work hard. Yeah. Work harder. Oh yeah. They say that about Dan Gable too. Yeah. The wrestler. Yeah. Hey, maybe not the fastest, but his thing was I'll, I'll outwork them all. You ever heard stories about him, Dan Gable? Yeah. He would just run from every every place he would go. He would run. 
Oh no, I didn't <laughs> yeah. hear that story. From but class like, to class in college, from yeah. class to the cafeteria, he'd run everywhere. Dang. So hard work. Now, okay, so that wraps up. We got talent on the one side, we got success on the other side, and that's cool. And we know that we can progress up that chart for the young people out there, and even the old people out there. If you if you if you're on the lower end of that chart of of the talent chart, boom, work hard. Apply discipline, make good decisions. You can end up further. You can go to the top of that success chart. Boom. Now, now we're going to get away. I guess we're going to get away from the holistic success a little bit here. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. This is a conversation that I've also had, and I had it primarily with two two people that I know pretty well, one of them very well and one of them decently well. And this is the conversation. These two individuals, high talent, high in the talent chart. So what does that mean? They're smart. You know, they've got that personal interoperability with other human beings. On top of that, super driven. On top of that, they've got the whole work thing, too. They got the discipline thing down, too. They got all that. They're maxed out in the game that they're playing. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by that? In soccer, how many goals can you score? Let's say you're the best team, you're the best player on your team, and you're going to play a season worth of soccer. Mm -hmm. How many goals can you score? In the whole season? In the whole season. I don't know. How many games is the season? I don't know. Let's call it, let's say you play 15 games. So you're going to, I don't know, 45, maybe 60 goals? Okay, that's completely unrealistic, but we'll take it. 15, so you say three goals, four, three goals four a game, goals 45. A game. Yeah, we'll go. The, this guy gets a hat trick, which is a rarity in soccer. And we'll say he gets it for every game for a 15 game season, and that's where he ends up. Fi- oh, okay. Yeah, I, he ends up at 45 goals. We'll I typically go with it. watch kids' soccer, so okay. my numbers might be off a little bit. Okay, now what if you were a basketball player? Mm-hmm. How many basket? how many games, how many goals can you make in basketball? In a game? You know, realistically, on the high end, 21 points. Yeah. Then you multiply that times a season, Mm -hmm. and you obviously can score way more in basketball than you can in soccer, clearly. This is where, again, I've had this conversation primarily around the financial aspects of work for people. If you get in, you have to look at the game that you're playing. Because sometimes the game that you're playing is soccer. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how much talent you have and it doesn't matter how much hard work you, you, you put into it. You can only score 45 goals and that's it. And meanwhile, someone that maybe doesn't even have the talent and doesn't have the work ethic that you had, but they're playing a different game and they're scoring 200, 300, 400 goals. They're making two, three times as much money as you. Why? Because the game that they are playing. So you have to look at that. Every game, just about, well, I'll say it. Every game that you can play has a cap on it of what you can actually make until you get to the top and you look at it and you change your angle. You change your, you change your angle of the game. Mm. You could say, I'm going to create a new game. You, know, you could get really good at soccer and say, you know what? I've maxed this game out. I'm going to create a new game mm. where it's a smaller field and a bigger goal. You, know, you could do that. And people do that in industry, right? People yeah. do that in industry. They they get to the top of their game and they start a new game, a different game. They change the rules a little bit where they can score more. Yeah. I'm totally supportive of that. Mm-hmm. The problem is I just want to make sure that people recognize that sometimes you've put in awesome, you've got, you're a very talented person, you've put in a lot of work and you got to the t- you got to the you, you, you capped out your game. You're going to get as many goals as you're going to get. That's it. Yeah. And so you can't get frustrated. I'll tell you what. I was in the Navy. I was in the Navy. Get everyone. I was in. I, I retired as an 04 E over 20, which means which means I was a prior enlisted guy. You can go look at what my salary was. And then you can add my little specialty pays in for jump, dive, demo, special duty assignment pay. You can add those little things in there. Yeah, yeah. You can add my B, uh, officer housing, basic allowance for housing in there. You can figure out. I mean, it's you're going to make this much money. That's it. That's the cap. Yeah. That's what you're going to make. Now, now we start to talk about 
can you play multiple games at the same time? And the answer to that is yes, you can. You can play multiple games. Now, I kind of I kind of said this on a different podcast. Somebody talked about, you know, having a side hustle while you're in the military. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, no, you can't really do that because you know, you got to focus 100% on your job. And then but the reality is, I had a side hustle the whole time I was in. Cuz I guess what I was doing? I was buying houses. I was saving my money. I was driving a 1997 Dodge Grand Caravan. And I was buying a house here. And I was buying a house there. And that's when you have a when you have a alternate job or an alternate game that you're going to play in the military, it's okay. It just has to be on a complete not to interfere basis. Mm-hmm. So does it interfere occasionally if you're a pro- if you got a few properties and one of them has a broken water heater? You can mitigate that by making sure you got a good property manager and making sure you know the right handyman that can go over and square that stuff away and get that problem solved. Mm-hmm. I had some kind of catastrophic situations. Mm-hmm. I had the big flood. <laughs> Sure, uh, the big f- broken no a slab like a well, cracked pipe in the slab. I had a crack. W- one of my rentals has flooded twice. Once from the ceiling, once from the ground. How does it flood from the ceiling? From the ceiling, crack pipe in upstairs. The, in, yeah, upstairs bathroom, crack pipe got somewhere. It. Boom, drip, drip, drip. Next thing you know, you got water damage. Yeah. The other one, pipes running through the slab because something goes wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. If that thing starts to leak. Tenants don't say anything for a long period of time, even though they're hearing, they're hearing squish, squish, squish under the, yeah, yeah, yeah. under the, the the flooring. Yeah. <laughs> they don't say anything. Guess what? Everything's ruined. Yeah. You got to come in. They, you know. So, what do you do with those catastrophic situations? Well, if you've got the right management uh, team in place, mm-hmm. gets handled. Gets handled. Make the phone calls. People get it taken care of. You don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. So you can do that. It's got to be on a not to interfere basis with your primary job if you're in the military. And really, it's the same thing if you have a primary. You know, you got your primary job. You're working for someone. You're doing nine to five. You don't want to interfere. You want you want your side alternative gig to be on a not to interfere basis with your primary gig. Mm-hmm. Now. The other thing that you can do, and this is where you start to look at, okay, because you, 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 you're playing games. You're playing these different games because you want to move yourself up on the success level. Sometimes you have, and I see people do this, and some people do this really well, they have one game that they're playing to make money. They have another game that they're playing to be, you know, to, to win in their health, right? They're doing mm-hmm. marathons. They're, they're jack and steel. They're, they're doing jujitsu. They've got another game that they're playing to get some sort of gratification out of life, some kind of positive gratification out of life, whether they're working as a volunteer, whether they're donating time to the soup kit, whatever you're, they're doing. They're doing something that's giving them some gratification that they're moving the ball forward for humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's a good thing in my opinion. So sometimes I think someone's they're 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 losing their soul because they're working a job to make money they don't like it they're not healthy and they're and they feel like they're just giving all their time to the man. Mm-hmm. What should that person do in that situation? Find some other games that you can play too. Find some other games. Find a game to take care of your health. Find a game to take care of your family. I mean, you know, for for family, right? How do you? What game can you play to take? Make sure you get the family unity that you want. There's all kinds of things that you can do, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's camping, whether it's vacations, whether it's going on on rock climbing trips, whether it's everyone going to do jujitsu, whether it's you're doing a 15 minute PT in the morning, wh- whatever. But there's thing, there's some games that you can play to br- to get that side of things. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of these various, we'll call them games that get played. But what I find, this is the whole point of this conversation. What I find is people aren't aware that they're in a specific game and that game has limitations and that game has rules. And if you don't recognize that, you're going to play that game and you're going to keep playing that game, soccer game, and you think you're going to get more goals. They're not coming because you can't do it. That game is limited in its own right. So what you have to do is you have to either change the game or you got to find a new game to get into. Mm-hmm. 
If you're young, look at what game you're going to play and figure out what you know how you're going to win in multiple games so that you can move yourself up on the success holistic success chart. Sure. So, there you go. That's the first thing I wanted to uh, to talk about today. Number one. The second thing I wanted to talk about is Connor versus Khabib. <laughs> All right. uh, okay, so Connor versus Khabib, and once again, this I realized I think the only other time we've t- talked about a fight in in in. On this podcast was another Connor fight. I think it might might have been Connor versus Nate. Nate. So, why are we talking about this fight? Well, there's there's two major reasons. Well, there's three major reasons, I guess. Now, one is was it the biggest fight of all time in UFC? It, it possibly was. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to compare now because yeah, yeah. It's over. I would say no. I would say yeah because the fan base is probably bigger than it's ever been. Yeah, just overall. What about and the then, hype behind this fight? No, I, f- I felt like. Well, then again, I don't know. That could be my bubble. Okay, but I didn't hear as much about really? it. I heard a lot about it for sure. I didn't, but wait, I didn't wait, hear which one did you hear more about? J- uh, Jose John, Al- John Jones. Some of the John Jones fights I really? remember. Yeah, and then um, also like a, some of the Brock Lesnar fights. I remember hmm. thinking like, "Dang, this is huge." Here's what I think. I don't know. No, no, no. Jose, sorry, Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo and, against and Conor, Conor McGregor. That yeah. was a huge. That might. That might have been. That might have been bigger, yeah. yeah. And they did more tour. They did the big press thing. Seems like it, yeah. Here's though, I, I think that people had a better handle on what could happen in the Jose Aldo fight. I think people didn't know what was going to happen in this fight. Yeah. What's funny is, for me, I was wrong by the way, but it was the opposite. I thought, oh, Jose Aldo is going to beat this guy up. Oh, really? And then actually, this one I, I thought Khabib was going to win too. Yeah. So that's let's get to that then. All right, um, I sent out a tweet, which I normally, you know, don't. And it, so I sent out a tweet. Here's the tweet. Here's the tweet that I actually sent out. It was to the notorious MMA, which is Connor. I said, "Stay outside the first three rounds. Don't overcommit strikes. Mostly jabs. Get booed by the crowd. Doesn't matter. Frustrate, frustrate Khabib. Force bad shots. Tire him out." In the fourth, start stepping up the striking. In the fifth, let it go and finish him. Good luck. John Kavanaugh, at John Kavanaugh, I tagged his coach. Mm -hmm. Because his coach, well, okay, now people are going, okay, well, why are you rooting for Conor McGregor? And some people went like a little crazy, like why are you, when he's a bad, sets a bad example for the sport and all Mm -hmm. that. So, actually the reason is because I've communicated with Coach Kavanaugh a, a decent amount on Twitter and little DMs and all that and just you know he he just has been kind of like a cool guy mm-hmm. and here he was going into coach his fighter in the biggest fight of of Connor's life and you know just because we've had that little converse we've had conversations on Twitter a bunch and I just threw that out there like mm-hmm. two hours before I mean we I was watching the first fights when I threw that out there mm. and you know what the really funny thing is John Kavanaugh texted back, or he he tweeted back, copy. So he, he actually read it and responded, yeah. which is pretty crazy. Um, so, so anyways, because I have had a little interaction with Coach John Kavanaugh, I felt like, you know, hey, I'll, th- I'll throw this out there. Also, you know Hans? Sure. Hans is like boys with Connor. Right, and Hans is my boy. Yeah. So I was, you know, that that association. There's sure. association. You yeah. know, I'm gonna be like, hey, Hans is my boy, and he has been for a long time, mm-hmm. and he's bros with Connor, and so I just, you know, like again. So so people are, why did you, why are you voting for this guy? When so there's that whole thing. Now the 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 other odd thing about this is you have a striker versus a grappler. Who do I root for in a striker versus a grappler? I, 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 I always root for the grappler and I know that factually and statistically the grappler has the advantage because grappling versus striking 
the grappler wins most of the time. Oh, can you go the distance with this argument? Sure, you can took it all the people that, all the times that a striker is actually a good grappler, yep. and then they don't use their grappling, but they use their grappling only to defend from being taken down, Chuck Liddell. And there's a bunch of, there's countless guys that you can now name that knocked people out and were known for their stand-up, but what they really were, their base was that they were a good wrestler and couldn't be taken down. Mm-hmm. So, but generally, striker versus grappler, the striker, and this is what I talk about from a self-defense perspective, right? If a if you're a good striker, the, then that means you can run away, hmm. Be, and and if you're a good grappler, once you get a hold of someone, you can defeat someone that has good striking. Here's the thing that people don't understand: in order for you to punch someone, you have to get close enough for them that where they can take you down. You have yeah. to get into their takedown yeah, range. The red zone. Yeah. You have to get in the red zone. Yeah. So once you're in the red zone, you can get taken down. So, how do you defeat that? As a as a um, striker, how do you f- defeat a really good grappler? Um, the way you do it is by well, doing what I just said. You stay on the outside. You you touch person up. You don't overcommit to strike because the, the harder you know this. How many rounds have you done of MMA sparring? Uh, countless. Okay, me too. So it, when I would be going against a striker. The harder they throw at you, the easier it is to take them down all day long. And when I'm going against a wrestler that I don't want to get taken down against, like I used to do this to Dean and just frustrate him, yeah. not commit to any punches, not throw any kicks at all, sit there and jab and run away for basically two or three rounds. And even Dean, who's a far superior wrestler to me, he would have a very, very hard time taking me down. Yeah. So. This is a legit strategy. The reason I know it's a legit strategy is because people have used it against Dean. When Dean was fighting MMA, people used that uh, particular strategy against him, and it worked. Mm -hmm. And so I know the strategy works. Guys that Dean was infinitely better on, on the ground, Mm -hmm. and yet he couldn't take him down. And he was infinitely better at wrestling. Why couldn't he take him down? Because they weren't playing that game. They weren't playing, they weren't even playing the MMA game. They were playing the, I'm gonna jab you and stay away. Now, a couple things also, Connor's attitude, Connor's, what do you wanna call it? His, his, the way he behaves, right? He's unsportsmanlike and he's a trash talker and all that. I, I get it. Number one, he's he's trying to sell fights. <laughs> like, we we is he a, a very confident, perhaps an overconfident guy? Actually, maybe. But if you ever see his work ethic, it's freaking solid. Mm-hmm. He's always respectful after a loss. So when he loses, he he is respectful and he says, "Hey, good job, you got beat." You know, he doesn't. He's not. He's not a poor loser. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's a hard worker. And do I wish that he would belay, behave a little bit differently? I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 him. Yeah. It's another thing is that's that's him. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's him. And you can't expect guys that are going to do what he's going to do for a living to behave the way that you want them to behave. It's the same thing with guys that are in the military. Right, you can't expect a guy that's going to go put his life on the line to be a, as as Kipling says, a, a plaster saint. Right, mm-hmm. doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. You got a guy that you want to go kill people and you want him to put his life at risk. Guess what? He's going to get a little crazy sometimes. And as a leader, as a even as society, we have to look at those guys and go, okay, look, we'll give you a little bit of room. We want you to stay in the box here. Mm-hmm. We don't want you to get out of control. And that happens all the time. Military guys get in trouble all the time. They get they get outside the box, but you got to give them a little bit of room. If you if you didn't want that type of person, you would have no one in the well. You would have a very few people in the military because right. you take someone that's attitude is, you know, hey, I'm a I'm a saint. Well, guess what? A saint doesn't want to go hunt people down and kill them. Mm-hmm. A saint doesn't want to get in the mud and blood blood and guts and be in that situation. It's, it's very similar with fighters. Mm-hmm. Now, are there fighters that? Do behave in a, in a in an idealistic way? Sure, absolutely there are. Mm-hmm. Is that preferred? Sure, that's great to see. I well, I'll prefer it. I don't know, but it's great to see. I mean, probably in in my I want to don't know who my favorite fighter of all time is, but Fedor mm-hmm. is definitely at the you know he's in the top three. 
yeah. of just my favorite fighters. And one of my favorite things about Fedor is Fedor showed no emotions ever at any time, win or lose, the same reaction. Yeah. He mostly won, but sure. he would just raise his hand. Like, he wouldn't barely even raise his hand. Yeah, it'd be like be, a half hurt. Yeah, it'd be like half, like, hey, I just, just destroyed this person and won $2 million here in Japan, and I'm taking the, the pride of, you know, Russia home with me. No yeah. big deal. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to go how. lift a kettlebell. <laughs> Uh, Sakuraba, Sakuraba yeah. is the same way. Very, very, and and the thing that was funny about Sakuraba again, he's one of my favorite fighters. Is Sakuraba the only thing that was you could you could hold against Sakuraba? Is sometimes he would like clown people almost. Yeah, and he was almost had some of that professional wrestling stuff going on. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, Connor is Connor. Connor will mature. He'll get older, and that's fine. He backs it up. He puts it on the line, bro. He puts on. He doesn't avoid fights. I can say that. Yes. You know, he takes the hardest fights he can possibly find. When he, when he lost to Nate Diaz to say, I want to fight him again next. Yeah. You know, that's legit. So, anyways, there was a couple people that were like straight up just hostile. Why are you supporting Connor? He's a bad sport. He just represents. Like, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. So there's why. John Cavanaugh, great coach. My buddy Hans, friends with him. Um, yeah. Now, for the actual game plan, the actual game plan that I talked about. Number one, stay outside. Stay outside. You stay outside the range of that person. You get just where you can barely touch him with a jab, and you get ready to sprawl. Now, Connor actually did a good job. He sprawled a few times. He he defended the takedown on several occasions. Mm-hmm. He did a good job on the bottom of, you know, uh, Khabib does this thing that Dean does too, which is he ties up your legs mm-hmm. with his legs, kind of like captures them. And when you yeah. can't pull your legs out when you're up against the cage, you cannot get up. Yeah. Connor got his legs out over and Sometimes, over and yeah. over. That was impressive. Yeah. That was impressive. So that's number one. You stay outside. It's really hard to take, you know, even, even against someone that's a great wrestler, me, and I'm not a great wrestler, I can... I can back up and stay away. It's, I'm really hard to take down, and so is any, so is anybody. If mm-hmm. you if your sole goal is to not get taken down, yeah. it's actually not that hard to not get taken down. Mm-hmm. Now it it changes when you when you start committing to your punches. It changes when you start trying to knock someone out. It mm-hmm. changes when you start getting into a wrestling match with people. Yeah. Then it's easy to get taken down. You know Taylor, right? I'll avoid a takedown on Taylor. As soon as we start mixing it up, guess what? Getting taken yeah, down. Yeah, getting taken down because I play his game. Mm-hmm. Can't play his game. Yeah. Okay, next part, don't overcommit. What happens when you throw strikes? Your weight goes forward. When your weight is forward, you you can get taken down. That, that's all there is to it. So you don't want to throw big, heavy punches early because that's when the takedown is going to come. Mostly jabs. Again, that's the lightest punch. You're furthest away. I wouldn't even throw kicks. Maybe a couple kicks, but I wouldn't throw him. He's fast. Connor's fast, so he might be able to get away with it. But I I probably wouldn't even throw any kicks in the first round. Maybe start throwing some kicks in the second round. Mm -hmm. But kicks, again, kicks take time, and a well-timed shot will take you down on a a kick. Can you chop at the legs? Yeah, you can chop at the legs. That can have a big negative impact on the person you're fighting. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Getting booed, right? Why did I say get booed? The reason I said get booed is because if you're doing this strategy right, people are mad at you mm. because they think you're avoiding the fight, they think that you're not being aggressive, and they're gonna get mad. The crowd is gonna hate you. Mm. And that's just what you gotta deal with, right? When your crowd is frustrated and annoyed at you, guess what, so is your opponent. So now your opponent starts getting frustrated and taking bad shots. Big time. Yeah. And when that, when that opponent is taking shots that are outside the zone, you basically have to be able to put your hands on someone, for the most part, in order to get a good shot and take them down, when you're outside that zone, it's you just there, there's a there's a there's a fraction of a second difference that it takes you to get to the sh- to the grip on the person mm-hmm. that you can you can stop it mm-hmm. you can stop it you can't you can't shoot from too far away and when you get someone frustrated and you're touching them up with jabs and they're getting mad and they're hearing the booze of the crowd they get frustrated they start shooting from far away when they start shooting from far away you sprawl on them you put your hands on the back of their heads you stand back up you walk away and you make them do it again you make them do it again you make them do it again i said tire them out and a lot of people were saying oh Connor's cardio is no good and that's not a good plan. You're an idiot that type of thing The reason I said that is because first of all wrestling is 
for the most part, wrestling is more tiring than striking. That being said, if someone's a, if someone's a good wrestler and not a good striker, they're going to get more tired striking than they are wrestling. So you, you take you take Khabib out of his game. His game is wrestling. He's not getting tired wrestling. He's yeah. getting a little bit tired. However, when he shot four times in a round and you've defended all of them, it is absolutely easier to defend takedowns than it is to 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 do takedowns. Mm. It's a lot easier. I mean, we do these drills all the time. In fact, the way that we run the drills, when you first when you're the first monkey in the middle, you're the one that's doing the takedowns. Mm. When you're more tired, all you have to do is defend the takedowns. Why? Because it's easier to defend takedowns. Mm. You don't have to work as hard. All you have to do is counter what they're doing. So you take him and you tire him down. And Connor, Connor's not going to get tired while he's striking, or he's going to get less tired while he's striking. Again, could could Connor use an improve in his cardio? Sure, sure. I've seen him fade. We've all seen him fade. That's a bad thing. He needs to step that game up. I'd love to look at his training and see where we could fill in those holes. But the bottom line is he's going to get more tired, which he did when he's in a wrestling grappling scenario than he does when he's standing up throwing jabs. He's, he looks like he's in, walking through the park when he's standing up. So you do that. You you. You, that's what you do. You stand up, you tire him out, and you don't overcommit and let him run at you. Now, some people say, well, usually Connor should just try and knock him out. There's a problem with that idea. Oh, is, is that great? Is it great when it happens to Aldo? Sure. You can't count on knockouts. You can't count on them. When you're throwing knockout punches, guess what happens? You're overcommitting. When you're overcommitting, it's easy to get taken down. So, there you go. Now, what actually happened in the fight? Connor pressed forward almost the whole time, which. <laughs> which when you press forward, it's easy for a grappler to time your move forward movement and shoot on you and take you down. And, and that's what happened. Like I said, he escaped, he escaped from the mount position a few times. That was impressive. He got, did you see the Kimura? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah the attempt. Khabib, oh. Khabib had a, a Kimura on him. Yes. Legit Kimura, and I was like, oh, this is over. Mm-hmm. Nope, nope, Connor got out. I think Connor got out through brute just like strength. So he got out of that. He recovered, recovered guard a few times. He freed his legs from those weird um, half guard sort of leg control things that Dean does. Mm-hmm. He freed his legs from those a bunch of times. He survived fairly well on the bottom in the early rounds, and that's all he needed to do. If he would have done this game plan of staying away, if he got taken down with one minute left because he starts throwing, then you survive for a minute. It's okay. It's okay. You survive for a minute, the round's over, and then you get to try it again. <sighs> again, the reason that I know this game plan works is because it's been used against my fighter, Dean. And you know who did Amar Sulev? He's a he's a Dean talked about him. He's a Russian guy that ended up like mafia dude or something, hitman. But that's what he did. Just stay away. The guy was a better striker and don't overcommit, and that's what happens. And you know what's also weird is people even do this in jujitsu matches. Yeah, they do this in ADCC, where hey, if I'm a great wrestler and you're better at jujitsu than me, and I don't want to go to the ground with you, I just play the patty cake for a while. And then I, what I do is when there's one minute left, I do one takedown, I get two points, and then I cover up and hold, yeah. and I win the match. Yeah. So people do this in jujitsu. They do this. Another thing that they do that they do in jiu-jitsu and this is something that you have to work on as a jiu-jitsu practitioner Let's say you and I are training mm-hmm. and You get the takedown on me What do I do? Well, I engage with my guard. I start looking for you know grabbing your arm I start looking for neck control. I immediately start doing jiu-jitsu with you What if I want to really? It, I have there's another there's, there's a whole nother game I can play with you, which is you take me down I immediately try and get back up. Yeah, that's a that's a totally different game yes, sure it is. This fouls up like I Used to not do this with Dean. I used to not do this with I, I do with Andy now because I have to Because people are gonna do that people are gonna do that they, when you're in a competition and Someone takes you down or, or you get yeah, you take someone down if they're not comfortable if they think you might be a little bit better than them on the ground, they're just going to try and get back to their feet. And that is a different game than just engaging in jujitsu. 
Yeah. Or if they don't like their bot, their, you know, guys, they don't like oh, to yeah, play they, the bottom. Yeah, yeah. They don't, for so sure. if they get taken down, it's like stand back up. They're right? just going to get back up. And that's, if you're not used to that, that is problematic yeah. for you on top. Yeah. If you, if you allow that situation to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's good to train with, I think I said this before, good to train with MMA guys because that's a lot of the time the case, unless they're like straight up jujitsu yeah. background guys. But, you know, you know, guys who just have essentially, um, a, a, what do you call it, a freestyle yeah, 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 yeah. Um, kind of style yeah, yeah, yeah. to them. They, and you, and since we do jujitsu, yeah, anytime I train with them, they don't like yeah. being on the bottom. So, so th- you get, get that up. training they're big time. Feet on the hips, they're oh, pushing yeah. your head away and they're just trying to get back up. Yeah. Again, the the theme or the reason that all that I have all this stuff in my head is because it's all about what game are you playing? Yeah. What game are you playing? And and again, Connor, that's one of the things that everyone loves about Connor, myself included, is he goes in there to fight. Yeah. And yet that instinct of going forward all the time against a guy that's a superior wrestler and grappler, which Khabib certainly is, and like I said, grappling broadly stated is superior to striking in a in a one-on-one situation yeah do you look hesitant no i i agree with that probably more than you do oh okay because and and there's obviously and i just had someone hit me up on social media that was like but what if you know what if you get punched what if the striker can punch you when you're trying to take him down it's like that case has gone through and through can a striker knock someone out Yes, they absolutely can. Mm. They have a puncher's chance. Oh, yeah. Can you rely on that? Hell no, you can't. Yeah. Hell no, you can't. Yeah. What were you going to say? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, most of the time, as far as how it has played out, oh, yeah, you yeah, you can knock the guy out. Oh, yeah, for oh, yeah. sure. Your yeah. knees, yeah, oh, yeah, it can happen for sure. But, yeah, you just do the, you run the statistics. No, it's like way harder to plan a knockout <laughs> on a, on a, but for a grappler to plan a submission is way easier. Oh, yeah. Like, you, you, but even in grappling tournaments, mm-hmm. the guy will be like, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to get this guy in a rear naked choke. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm going to do. And against another grappler, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's way it's way easier to plan because it's way more methodical. It's like way, way less like, what do you call it, like chaotic. Yeah. You know, I mean, and don't get it wrong. Like strikers know how to control their environment. I dig it. Yeah. But just the nature of what it is, you know. There, there's, oh. no, there's no doubt. And again... Broadly speaking, because I am totally pro striking, and you have to be able to strike, and your your Muay Thai and your boxing kills, the better they are, the better you are as a human being. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if, yeah, I mean, if you've ever trained, if anyone here doesn't believe in striking at all, go and train with somebody that's a really good high level striker, and they will jack you up. Yes, they will jack you up. You will be, you will feel like a white belt in jujitsu on the mat. Yes, the only difference is. If it's if you talk if you flip a switch and you make it MMA and you can grab a hold of them yeah. you can you can all of a sudden you can equalize it very quickly that's why jujitsu came about that that's why it, well not why it came about that's why it came onto the scene so strong it's because yeah. all the striking stuff as awesome as it is yeah. we just saw another example of it on Saturday night that's what I'm talking about yeah. And I'm not even saying Connor is a far superior. If Connor is a phenomenal striker, once he's on the ground, he's on the ground, and those strikes don't mean anything anymore. Barely. Yeah, especially these guys with like super good grappling. Yeah, and you know they can keep going. You know, when you gas, and this will go into kind of what your um, strategy was. If a grappler gasses, he a grappler gasses, and that goes for anyone in a fight. If you gas out, you're you're essentially ineffective. But yeah. so, kind of that aside, the well, the the reason that pe- that it seems like oh yeah, all these guys like uh, Lyoto Mashida, right? He was a big one who kind of exploded onto the scene and just beat up everyone. And he was a karate guy, mm-hmm. right? Black belt in jujitsu, by the way. But mm-hmm. no one yeah. wants to talk about that part. <laughs> yeah. Or even like a Chuck Liddell type character where he's just knocking. He's straight up knocking everybody yeah. out, grapplers and everything superior wrestler by yeah, the way yeah, yeah. but so it's one of those things where it's like yeah if you don't know any grappling oh yeah your your chances of success especially as time goes on go go way down um but most people if they're like primarily striking or striking is their kind of their their success uh you know that's what gives them success they have to learn even like a, a few fundamentals in grappling and get really good at them just defensively mm-hmm. to start start with but if you don't know anything like if you know how to defend the takedown, that's grappling right there yeah, already. Yeah. Yeah, already. Sure. And if you get really good at that, then okay, that's gonna help you a lot. But that's grappling. Now, what if you 
essentially fail at defending the takedown, meaning you get taken down. Yeah. You have to learn to get back up. If yeah. you don't, you'll get held down there straight up. Yeah. If you don't, like take a big strong guy mm-hmm. and just a normal sized person, one guy knows jiu-jitsu, put the big strong guy on his back. Like even in guard, bro, he won't get up. No. If the guy's like, hey, don't let him up. Yeah. He won't get up straight mm-hmm. up. He And the harder he tries, mm-hmm. the less ability he's going to have to get up. It's like throwing somebody in the water who can't swim. Yeah. And like he can't even tread water, no. not, let alone swim. He can't tread. Try as hard as you can. The harder you try, the yeah. more it's just gonna not work. But you teach someone to just tread water. Oh, he'll handle. He'll handle a little bit. But oh, you just learned how to tread water, though. You learned how to swim a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you got to learn that stuff. And what's nice, well, you need to take this into account is that the UFC rounds are are only five minutes. Yeah. So they're only five minutes, which means you could see it took it took time for Connor's good enough that it, he's not getting like just caught you, you know, made a quick mistake and get caught no he's making a series of mistakes that take time and then finally they get capitalized on mm-hmm. if he can make it three minutes on the feet every round right. man the chances of him getting submitted in two minutes by Khabib especially right. when he was ma- doing good maneuvers on the bottom bottom they're not really that good mm-hmm. and you know, can you make a mistake and get guillotined? That normally happens to the grappler. That's like grappler versus grappler. I shoot on you, you grab right. the guillotine, yeah. or I try and post and you do an arm lock. That usually happens not from, most of those moves come out of me me engaging in grappling with you, not me getting away from you. Yeah. Me getting away from you exposes less mm-hmm. of grappling submissions. Yeah. Unless you do poor mistakes, like turn your back, yeah. then you got a problem. You you're, a gonna problem. Have a, you're gonna have a problem. And I suppose we should also talk about the uh, the after situation, mm-hmm. after the fight. Sure. And uh, you know, Khabib, who's normally very stoic and calm, mm-hmm. he lost it. Yeah, yeah. He ran out in the crowd. Connor uh, and I w- was watching in detail some of these little v- clips, mm-hmm. and Connor was getting nuts too. Let's let's not make any mistakes about it. <laughs> Because, yeah, so, and then the guy came in from Connor's, from Khabib's team and soccer punched Connor. Mm-hmm. That was gnarly. <clears throat> and so, what do I think of all that? Yeah, it's horrible. Is it bad for the sport? Yes, it's bad for the sport. Um, interestingly, Joe Rogan posted that Brendan Schaub kind of made a prediction. Yeah, the prediction. Yeah, he made a prediction that something was going to get crazy. Yeah. And that's a, that was accurate. Uh, what do I think about it? I think it's a bummer. Yeah, it's it's a bummer. It's a bummer to see. I'm so su- I was surprised to, to see Khabib get crazy like that. Yeah. Um, the fight was over. You could see that Connor was pretty humble in defeat. He was sitting there like, "Hey, all right, right. Uh, that's a bummer." And Khabib got nuts for those moments. And I don't know what's going to happen. Mm. I don't know what's going to happen in terms of. I know they didn't. They had, I don't think they paid him yet. Hmm. They didn't pay him his two million dollar purse. Yeah, wouldn't that be an athletic commission thing though? Oh yeah, like, it was definitely is the athletic. Him. Yeah, so they'll they'll find him. They'll take part of his purse, mm-hmm. and that's just money. That's like you know when you pay a speeding ticket. Yeah, and the state gets the money. Yes, it's the same, same thing. Deal. So they the athlete the Nevada State Athletic Commission could find him half his purse and put one point five. Or no, he he made two million dollar purse. He could put a million. He could put the Net Nevada State Athletic Commission could put a million dollars in their pocket by saying, "Oh, yep, you shouldn't have done that. We're finding you. We're finding you half your purse. Boom! Here's a million dollars. Let's build a new office center or whatever. Sure, office center. <laughs> Dig it. So yep. I don't know what's going to happen. It's not good to see that. I wish everyone would be better sports. Uh, that would be good. Yeah. But people are super emotional. Yeah. And they haven't learned to control their emotions yet. <sighs> Which brings me to the third point that I wanted to talk about this week. Sure. Were you going to say something? Uh, no, no, I, I dig it. Uh, but the, there is like a bigger kind of picture here with the industry. So anything that's quote unquote bad for the sport, right? That's mm-hmm. that that is something. But there's two elements, right? There's 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 the growth of the sport, mm-hmm. and then there's like promotion of the sport for the people who are in this who are in the are game we about already. to get a bad press is good press <laughs> any press is good press rather as a dichotomy so yeah the growth of the sport to the guy who doesn't watch mma because it's so barbaric we're watching okay what well, the pettis fight right same mm-hmm. same event pettis and ferguson 
Yeah. By the way, I like Ferguson. Okay. That dude's a hard worker. Yeah. I like Pettis too. Okay. And and I and I definitely like Duke Rufus. Yeah. Sure. My, my boy. My boy. There was you know we would be cornering people backstage and Duke Rufus was always. I mean he doesn't probably doesn't know anything. He probably wouldn't even barely know who I am at all. Mm-hmm. But he would always be like super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Duke he's Rufus. Legit. He's awesome. Yeah. So that fight. But and Pettis. And Pettis is a good dude too. You know. Yeah. I like Pettis. Yeah, really seems like it. Um, but that was a bloody fight. Yeah, it was. So, and there's bloody fights every once in a while, right? Guys with the huge gashes, whatnot. So, okay, bloody fight, right? And so me, my brother, my cousin, we were watching this fight. Mm-hmm. And uh, so these guys are just basically punching each other in the yeah, face, kneeing each other in the face, bleeding like all oh, over, yeah, you know, like super bloody. The kind of where they got to stop the fight and be yeah. like, hey, doctor, check this guy out. Yeah. That, you know, so it gives you an hey, doctor, now. Or hey, time out while we just clean up blood off everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Let's they so take one about those. a minute here just to wipe blood off everyone. Yeah. yeah. And meanwhile, we're just watching like, oh, whatever. Like, actually, it's like there have been more eventful fights than this one. Yeah. Like it ended in a, you know, he broke his hand broke his or whatever. Hand. And it was, and that was considered uneventful. I broke his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From oh, punching a guy in the head. Stopped. Yeah, they stopped the fight <laughs> and that was uneventful. We consider that uneventful. An eventful fight is a guy who gets knocked out unconscious flat out, which with, which happened, by the way, a few fights earlier. Anyway. Ooh, yeah, that's right. So we're watching this blood everywhere. And meanwhile, we're like, okay, you know, like whatever. But so. That my point is the growth of the sport. You get a guy who doesn't watch MMA; they only watch, um, you know, basketball, football, the traditional sports, Tradition. and they get a glimpse into MMA and they see that all the blood and stuff. They're like, "This is a dumb sport. This yeah. is not even a sport. This is like this shouldn't be legal. This is like mm. two human beings and everyone cheering." Meanwhile, okay, so when the fight stops, that that Pettis uh, Ferguson fight, it stops right. They stop it. They, you know, how they cut to the crowd every once yeah. in a while just to see their reaction. There's like businessmen in their suits drinking their drinks. It's like the epitome of like gladiator old school. Uh. The king with all the grapes and the <laughs> stuff and high fiving and stuff, right? Meanwhile, these two guys are like, one guy has a broken hand, the other guy has blood. All, well, they both have blood all over, right? So, as an outsider looking in, you're like, it's reasonable to expect them to be like, this is this is dumb. This is not a sport. I'm not going to sign on to this at all. Okay. Then you get these post fight shenanigans, Khabib and guys jumping out of the ring into the crowd, continuing to fight. After he won, by the way. So, and I'm not saying that this is how I'm looking at it. I'm saying this is how an outsider will see it. Interesting. And then you see, you know, months ago, whatever, Connor flying into New York and busting up the bus yeah. with Khabib in it, and it's this thing, and you know, all this stuff, guys getting injured from the broken glass, <laughs> all this stuff, right? It's a, it's a, it's not cool yeah. from an outsider looking yeah. in. It's like this is not a sport. This is dumb. These guys aren't people. These aren't civilized people. All this stuff. But from the inside. Well, man, I'm really looking forward to this fight now. <laughs> After Connor did that, then, you know, then, uh, you know, things happen. Connor's talking all this trash. It's like, oh, and he's backing it up. Oh, my gosh, I want to see this even more now. Yeah. If you get, and I like Fedor, too. That's Fedor. I yeah. like him, too. What if everyone was like Fedor, though? There will oh, be a nice. lot of fights that you just don't care about. Yeah. You'd be like, hey, all right, cool. Or, but on the flip so side. So you're saying, because I would, I would care about all of them. You would not care about you yes. care about them less. Less, I think. Well, no. you, I don't know. I don't know what you care about from sometimes, <laughs> but the people, because I, the reason Fedor is Fedor, to the extent that Fedor is Fedor, is, is because other people are not right, like Fedor. You get to compare him to everyone else; it yes. gets all crazy, and he just sits there and looks at him, and then knocks him out, or yeah. chokes him out, or arm locks. Because when you think about it, isn't that really the martial art spirit? For just sure, super stoic, and that's how it has Which been. Is, yeah. Yeah, but now, hey, martial arts. Let's face it. When you're in the game, if you watch MMA, especially UFC, if you watch this, this is it goes like the martial arts spirit of the thing is very small, yeah. very small. This is a show. Yeah. Don't get it wrong. This is a show with real punches, That's real kicks, point. blood, all that stuff, and this is all part of the show. What yeah, happens? I when- definitely think of it more as a sport than I mm-hmm. do think of it as a display of martial arts for the community. Right. Yes. No, I'm not thinking of it that way anymore. Yeah, it's a sport, but I would even go beyond sport. It's a show straight up because yeah. if it was just oh, a sport. You know what they did for the first time? I don't know if you noticed this. You probably did. They had like fog on the on the octagon yeah, yeah, floor. Yeah. yeah. I was like. Only mm, for kind of the dry ice yeah, effect. Dry ice effect, right? Yeah. Really? Like, what do you think? Yes. I give that the negatron. Yeah, well. And there was a while where UFC was trying to lean towards the other direction. They took away all the show stuff and they made yeah. it look like Sporty. more like a sport. Sporty. Yeah, yeah. And With now the they're kind of going back a little bit. Too. Right. 
Yeah, man, it's in because the new owners took over. Well, yeah, and you know that was obviously like a quote unquote branding play. You know, mm-hmm. we want to kind of go mainstream with the sport edge of it, and you know, make it a kind of a wholesome. Here's the thing, Brad. It's not a wholesome thing. Like it's totally. There's a difference between scoring a, a ball in a basket or running across the end zone or the goal line for a touchdown and all this stuff. Out running guys trying to just basically tackle you to the ground. And there's a difference between that being the goal and the goal being to hurt the guy as bad as he possibly yeah. can or to incapacitate them as, <laughs> he, bu- as bad as he possibly can. You know, something can. I said on when I was on Joe Rogan's podcast is I was like, if you go watch with any of those other sports, when they escalate, they escalate to what you actually want to see, which is MMA. <laughs> Like what yeah. happens when a basketball yeah. game gets a little too rough? They fight each other. Yeah. What happens when hockey gets a little bit? They fight each other. Right. What happens when football gets a little bit too rough? They fight. Even yeah. baseball. Someone yeah. someone does something out of line in baseball. They fight each other. Yes. Let's just get rid of the ball. Get rid of the net. Yeah. Get rid of the <laughs> hockey stick and just put <laughs> some gloves on and get it on. Yeah. And that yeah that's why and that I mean obviously that's a whole a whole other thing but if you and I'm not saying there's necessarily a confusion between mm-hmm. it like. Uh, the sport and the show and the martial arts and all that, but I'm just saying they're they are three different elements. And the, the sometimes main part it's, is the show. you just gave me a whole like interesting idea. So sometimes for me, I'm so functional, like I, I operate in such a functional mindset that it doesn't even work, right? It just doesn't work. It doesn't work with normal people, oh, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I, like, like hey, typical. just like, no, this is just going to be, uh, we're just going to be plain. If I was, if I was in charge of the entire UFC, what would it look like? And mm-hmm. it would probably just be so functional. It'd be the extreme that you would that you're saying people would just be like, I don't really know if I want to watch this. Mm-hmm. However, I would say if you dug deep into the training methodologies and you really understood the people, which UFC does a decent job now with the uh, what's it called when they're leading up to the fight, they yeah, do yeah, the embedded, shows embedded. And, yeah, yeah. So you could watch the embedded. You get to see kind of. It's it's not highly edited, embedded, and you get to see. What, but I would, you know, for me, I would make the whole thing would be like functional. It would be like, oh, there would be lights that show you everyone. There would be color lights. Why would you need color lights? You know what I mean? You get everybody fired up. Yeah, man. no, we wouldn't do that. You get want to get fired up. You see the guy walking into the cage that's about to that's yeah. about to fight another human being. Well, it doesn't work that way though. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. Like the. Even if it like again go back to everyone being stoic, right? Mm-hmm. It'd be like it'd be reduced. It would be less of a show. And in fact, you might even argue that it's kind of have has. We've seen that before, like in just like other like you ever watch like uh like a karate tournament or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like they don't develop characters or right, nothing right, like right. that. They're just this is guy and hey, this guy's good. And so like cool, I want to see what he's good at. And then you sort of forget about it. You don't anticipate that unless you're way way in the game. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. These- my my personal uh, vision doesn't always line up well with like the drama creation that everyone else likes. Yeah. But that's that's literally life. That's like why. That's why you want to watch it, because of pop, or a big part of it is because of the drama. Chael Sonnen, wise man, right, said one time, once one fight ends, that's when the promotion for the next fight begins. Yeah. So that you know, when he gets on the mic after the fight is done, he's essentially he's promoting the next fight. Next fight yeah. And but and the thing is, it's it's totally proven. Like he, even like someone saying, why do you care? Why like people coming to you saying, why are you supporting Conor? He's such a bad role model. All that. That's all good stuff. Like, well, if, if they if they were like, oh, who's that guy? Connor, well, yeah. you support this guy. Let me look into this guy. Yeah. That's a failure. But yeah, to, to love him, hate him. The thing is, if I dislike a guy and there's guys that I dislike, I understand. Dang. I don't dislike them as people. I dislike dislike what the, we call the UFC character. Yeah. You know, like the guy that that's on the mic and doing the whatever. I'm just not a fan. Actually, I'm the anti fan. I want him to lose. Like if he's fighting a guy, uh, unless yeah. I don't know the other you guy. Know what's interesting? You know, what I think kind of changed my perspective a little bit is I like Tito Ortiz. Yeah. He had this. He has a horrible. His reputation was always like he was a jerk and yeah, all this he's stuff. A bad guy. Yeah, he was a, a heel. Yeah, heel. And yeah, yeah. and I I didn't know him well, but I mean I trained with him some, and you know Dean Dean, Dean trained with him a lot, so I kind of knew him by proxy. And Tito Ortiz sure. as a dude, as like a just a dude outside of that whole world, yeah. totally cool and totally good to go. Yeah, you know, totally cool. Well, and, hey, Bisbing's the same way. Like yes. Bisbing, kind of a heel. Yep. 
I've met Bisbing. I trained with Bisbing. Bisbing's totally good dude. You know, trains so, hard, hard work, great work ethic, yeah. good dude. I, and I'm not saying again. I, I don't want to make it sound like I know these guys and I'm all bros with them because I'm not. But I've trained with them. I've been on the mat with them. You know, like I know, I I, I c- can understand their character outside yeah. of the character that they play on TV, on, on TV and yes. the character that they have. And maybe that's why for me, when I look at Connor and I see all this stuff. I look at it and I think, yeah, you know what? Behind that, it's going to be another guy that's a hard worker that wants to win and take care of his family. Like, well, okay, and he's got he's doing some stuff and he's talking about red panties and you know yep. he just that's what he's doing. Because yeah. and I look at it the same way I see a guy like Bisbing, a guy like Tito Ortiz, who are behind that that front that they put up. Yeah. They're just they're just hardworking guys that yeah. like to fight. Yeah, but I don't see Connor as a bad guy, as the heel though. Connor's a good guy. He's like, he's anti-opponent. Like he'll he'll really kind of he'll talk bad about his opponent. Not necessarily bad, like yeah. like necessarily bad. Yeah. But you know he'll talk himself up over his opponent kind of thing. But he's not like like Bisping will, will actively just like Chelsea and just like uh, Tito Ortiz. <laughs> they'll actively play the bad guy yeah, just yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. to the point where they will be categorized as that. Oh and yeah. Some people will you be fans the, of. Think about the stuff that. Chael Sonnen was saying oh, yeah. about Anderson Silva. Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah, you just, yeah. That totally. was crazy. And Chael Sonnen's a good example, but even though Chael Sonnen, you can tell, bro, that guy's yeah, nice. Yeah. Like, you ever talk to Chael? I did stuff with Chael Sonnen, uh-huh. video-wise, right? And, bro, like, full-on accommodating, yeah. like, uh, like, overly polite person uh-huh. in ways that he doesn't have to do that. You don't have to do this polite stuff. So he's, an, he's one of those guys, but I could tell, like, okay, this is the show and I get it. Yep. And actually, I dig it. Um, like Bisping, I was genuinely surprised how nice he was. I did a video with yep. Bisping. If you want to look at it, very funny video too, by the way. Which one did you do with Bisping? It's Hinato Laranja's show. I forget what episode, but we played oh, yeah, a they reenactment did they did. of Snatch. Uh, yeah. He was, he played, uh, the main guy. Turkish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turkish. So Snatch, the movie, right? We what did you, what you, did you, did you call it? You didn't call it Snatch. What'd you call it? Snatchy. Snatchy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good. He does a really good yeah. job. So it's, it's Michael Bis- Bisping. Kit Dale mm-hmm. is Tommy, and then Hinato hey, is. Hey, let me ask you this: Brooke. Kenny Florian. Kenny Florian. When you did the Heat, Heech, Heech, Heech yeah, that that he's got some chops, Very some much straight so. up acting chops. Yes, Kenny Florian, shout out. Yes, yeah, straight and up acting chops. So Kenny Florian, not to go too deep into that, but okay, so li- on top of that, Kenny Florian is super nice too. Yeah, and nice where he got tested with with us with me. Um, on how nice he could be as far as tolerance. So we go up there, right? Oh, I this is when you had to cameras, reshoot the whole thing. Had to reshoot the whole thing. Two cameras, right? We get, and so, you know, one angle on him, one angle on Hinato. The angle on him, the camera just didn't work. Something <laughs> with the SD card or whatever. Yeah. This, and we totally had to, like, get access to the restaurant after hours and, like, all this stuff. Schedule with Kenny, not to mention, yeah. who is like, you Busy. know, this is like after he crossed over into straight up mainstream. You can't yeah. just get Kenny Florian yeah. off. Of, you know, he had shows and like he was kind of a high level guy at this time. And I get home like we're, you know, we're editing and I'm like, we got to, there's no choice. We got to reshoot this thing. And then oh, we're like, man, and Kenny Florian, yeah. Like, whatever. He's like, yeah, cool. Well, let's go. Go, like, reshave. He had a goatee and stuff like that. When uh, Dean and I were doing the trials for ADCC in 2002 for the 2003 ADCC, Ken Flo came out, and he was one of the competitors. And the same thing. Like, we didn't really know him that well, but, you know, we were all kind of like a black belt. She's and all that stuff. So, yeah. actually, I wasn't a black belt at that time. I was a brown belt. <laughs> but we, you know, everyone was just, like, super cool, you know. Yeah. The Dean was a brown belt. What am I talking about? I was a purple belt. Dang. Dang. That's back in the two. All right. So where this whole thing goes from, and this is interesting that, that you brought this up. There's the, no, the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is this idea of a ta- detachment, which talk about all the time. And I've seen like another little reveal on detachment maybe another angle okay so picture this black belt versus a white belt you're training jujitsu mm. the white belt is like g- grabbing your sleeve or grabbing your belt or grabbing your, like doing something mm. whatever he's doing doesn't matter and it will not affect the outcome mm-hmm. at all 
and I see and so what should you do as a, as a black belt as a as a better grappler what are you gonna do when someone's doing something that doesn't matter what do you do you just kind of ignore it it's like okay that's not gonna affect the outcome I'm not gonna worry about it mm-hmm. as leaders I see people getting caught up all the times in little things that will not affect the outcome unless they let it mm-hmm. so I see some white belt below them in the chain of commands going all crazy grabbing their sleeve and this leader on the top like gets concerned about it and puts time and effort into something that doesn't matter whether it's a little personality rub a little ego uprising it's like, should we do it this way or should we do it that way it doesn't matter that's a little sleeve grab it doesn't matter and I see people getting caught up on things that don't matter all the time and what I've realized is it's something that I figured out a long time ago I don't know when but a long time ago I figured out you know what that thing doesn't matter I'm not gonna worry about it that thing doesn't matter I'm not gonna worry about it that thing doesn't matter I'm not gonna worry about it that thing matters I'm gonna focus on that thing Mm. and that makes that makes a big a big 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 difference it's it's leadership capital because if I'm investing my leadership capital and getting your hand off my sleeve or trying to do it my way instead of your way or trying to keep your ego in check if that's what I'm investing my leadership capital is, I have nothing left to invest in the thing that actually matters. Just like if you're a black belt and some guy's grabbing your sleeve and you focus on pulling that hand off your whole time, you're going to waste energy. And maybe you even give up position because you're because you're focused on something that did not matter. So it is inf- important to realize and to learn to differentiate between things that don't matter and things that do matter. And in order to tell the difference between those two things, you have to be able to detach and step back. And obviously, this is the same thing, not just with jujitsu, not just with leadership, not just with combat, because it's the same thing in combat. You're going to have things that don't, things that happen on the battlefield that don't matter. Hmm. Little, hey, guys moving here instead of there. That doesn't matter. Oh, this guy's moving there, so it doesn't matter. The enemy's doing this. Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, wait, the enemy did that thing? That matters. Or one of my guys did this thing? That matters. So how do you learn to discriminate between the two? You have to be able to detach from it. That's what you have to do. You have to be able to detach. And if you if you don't learn to detach... You're going to constantly get tripped up on things that don't really matter. And I'll tell you, the more, the better you get, the less things matter. The better you get, the less things matter. And the better you get, the more, the more important things matter. Mm -hmm. So you, you end up just wasting no energy on things that don't matter and focusing all your energy on things that actually matter. And this is the difference, man. This is how you win in jiu-jitsu. This is how you win as a leader. This is how you win in combat. And this is truly how you win in life. Think about all the things. You know what you used to talk about a lot? You haven't done it in a while. You used to talk about distractions, how things can distract you. That's totally true. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The things that distract you from what actually matters. So you have to, you have to figure out how to detach from those things I was doing some reading as is per norm and there's a guy named Keith Douglas he was a British soldier World War two he's kind of a badass he was stuck in an administrative position in October of 1942 during the second battle of El Alamein and so he was stuck in this administrative position so he just went a wall and went to the front line and joined the fight and got after it and one of the things that he wrote He said, to be sentimental or emotional now is dangerous to oneself and to others. So, what is he talking about? You can't get emotional. You can't get sentimental. You can't get caught up in things that don't matter. After his return from Africa, this guy, Keith Douglas, he wrote a book about his experience. Here's a little excerpt. You can kind of think about what this guy has been through that taught him these lessons here we go as I came up to them I recognized one of them as Robin the observation officer whose aid I had been asking for earlier in the day I recognized his fleece lines fleece lined suede waistcoat and polished brass shoulder titles and then his face 
strained and tired with pain. His left foot was smashed to a pulp, mingled with the remainder of a boot. But as I spoke to Robin, saying, Have you got a tourniquet, Robin? He answered apologetically, I'm afraid I haven't, Keith. I looked at the second man. Only his clothes distinguished him as a human being. His face had gone. In place of it was a huge yellow vegetable. The eyes blinked in it without lashes and a grotesque huge mouth dribbled and moaned like a child exhausted with crying. So uh, there's an example of a horrible situation that you have to learn to detach and you have to be able to focus on things that actually matter because as Keith Douglas said to be sentimental or emotional now is dangerous to oneself and to others now as I was digging into a little bit of Keith Douglas and we'll, we'll get to Keith Douglas fully on the podcast but he he added to that line he added another line that I want to hit as well to be sentimental or emotional now is dangerous to oneself and to others and he continues to trust anyone or to admit any hope of a better world is criminally foolish as foolish as it is to stop working for it so I you know that's a little tangent that's a tangent but it's powerful and like I said we'll get to Keith Douglas's book and that book got published after the war and unfortunately Keith Douglas never saw that book get published because he was killed by enemy mortar fire on June 9th just a few days into the D-Day invasion of Normandy which he took part in but Again, luckily, he left us uh, a lesson, which is to control your emotions. And I think as a a person and as an individual, if you can start trying to discriminate between things that matter and things that don't matter, and the way that you do that is by detaching from everything, and then you can pay attention and you can assess logically, not emotionally, what's important and what's not. And you focus on the things that matter and it's going to make your entire life a lot easier. It's a great lesson from Keith Douglas. And I think that's uh, all I've got for today. I will say that speaking of lessons, mm-hmm. I've got a, a little lesson to pass on. Sure. In a book, in a forthcoming book, it's called Mikey and the Dragons. <laughs> and if you didn't hear about the book yet, Mikey and the Dragons is about a young kid that's scared of everything, and that makes his life pretty hard, pretty miserable, because mm-hmm. he's scared of everything. And one day he finds a book, and one day he. He's scared of everything. He finds this book, and, and, and there's a book within the book in the story. And we'll go into the book within the book right here real quick. Sure. And then one day, Mikey noticed a book. He opened it up and took a quick look. It had pictures of dragons with fangs like a snake and all kinds of scary things that made Mikey shake. But in the pictures, there was a boy, too, who didn't look scared but like he knew what to do. And even though Mikey was scared indeed, he decided that he would give the book a read. He opened the first page, which he eagerly read, and this is what the dragon book said. There once was a kingdom long ago and far away, and the kingdom had suffered a horrible day. Their protector and leader, their king, he had died. And when they found out, the whole village cried. When the king was alive, he was a powerful force. Now they took the dead king away by carriage and horse. They knew they would miss him, 
and that made them sad but there was something else that made them feel bad the king had always been so strong and brave and protected the kingdom from the dragon cave the dragon cave was just over the hill and filled with scary dragons that were ready to kill and the story continues from there and explains that no one in the village in the kingdom would stand up to the dragons except the young prince who is only seven years old and he's nervous and he's scared he doesn't know if he can handle it but he kind of realizes he's gonna have to step up so he goes to his father's war chest (laughs) I'm so happy that I could put the word war chest in a book yeah and he finds the shield and he finds the sword of his dad and they're both super heavy but then he also finds a little note a little note from his father the king that explains how to overcome the dragons so even though this book is aimed at kids I think we all know that we all have dragons to fight mm-hmm. and like I said on the last podcast I really wanted to get this book into the hands of kids and really into the hands of everyone but again my publisher told me that there was no scenario where this book gets published by November so what did I do Um, I started my own publishing company and the book will be out in November (laughs) so yeah it's it's actually getting printed at this time and in order to pull this off in order to actually know how many books I need to print, I think it already looks like I need to print more books because you all ordered a lot of them already. So thank you, uh, pre-order, so that I know what to print. So I can print enough of the sacred first edition. First edition. If you want you and your kids and your family to know how to crush their dragons. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, gonna need that that's what's gonna happen we're gonna go forward together slay dragons in this case who's the dragon well you know big publishing companies (laughs) sometimes (laughs) Uh, anyways we all have our dragons to fight and when we fight our dragons well I don't know maybe sometimes we could use some help sure echo sometimes you only know any way that we could Maybe get some help fighting our dragons. Yeah, so help. the dragons, the dragons, our sure. dragons, sure, our dragons. Yeah, so I'll tell you this: this what this might help. This will help actually, if you realize to the full extent that capability, capability and knowledge that will help you fight the dragons. Those two things are imperative in fighting dragons. Yeah, so. We're staying on the path. That's mm-hmm. the capability part. The, actually, the path is both. Yeah, the path, path. is straight. The path up. covers all. Yeah, capability, knowledge, always trying to improve. So every step forward on the path is a step forward in capability, knowledge. Check. Right. Check. As opposed to the slippery slope, which is a step backwards <laughs> in capability and knowledge. <laughs> Got to be careful on that one. Yes. So what? What capability? Right. Is preparation, execution, results. Right, mm. just made that up right now, literally. So it could could be flawed, but whatever. Sounds good to me. So, so staying on the path. What? Start with jujitsu, of course. Good place we to start. We talked about jujitsu. Good universal kind of overarching. Yeah. How many people hit you up a day that just started jujitsu? Um, a lot. And <laughs> what I started doing, trying to do, is everyone that's that's indicating they just started jujitsu, first day jujitsu, uh, second day jujitsu, just got my kid into jujitsu. I just retweet it. Oh. And be like, boom, you're, you know, in the game, just letting people know, Welcome hey, game. look, it's boom. OK. Yep. yep. Here's another person. All different type of scenarios, too, by All the way. All different types. Here's the here's what I six years into. old, 12 years old, 29 years old, well, bad back, yep. uh, you know, hurt elbow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a surgeon. I'm a firefighter. I'm a police officer. I'm a CEO. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Good. Jump Getting in the game. Yeah. All good. And every once in a while. I'll see this. Yes, got my kids into jiu-jitsu. You know, one of them I, ho- I wish was maybe a little bit more into it. You know, mm. like what should I do or so or whatever. Yeah. Maybe not even that. They just said, be like, bro, you jump in there. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. so it's like it's because a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, this is perfect for my kid. Oh you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Or my if, kid wants to jump in. If oh, yeah. yeah, if you're if you're taking your kids to jiu-jitsu, 
and you're not participating, we got an issue. Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's at the very least just consider that. Just consider it. Think about no, it. No, I'm, t- I'm no. saying you're up, saying you jump in. Issue. Yeah, get yeah. it. Get it. Yeah, man. So I had a, a, a cool guy come into the gym here, and was in a uh, police officer, and he had his kids. Yeah. All fired up, you know, all the kids are into it. They're so fired up. That's awesome. I was like, oh, you know, what class are you going to? He's like, well, I guilt tripped him immediately. <laughs> Level seven <laughs> guilt trip. Yeah. I was like, bro, are you kidding me? Come on, yeah. get on the mat. So he's in the game now. Yeah, so, and <laughs> and that's not like that rare of a story because in even just how our gym is laid out where, yeah. you know, the kids class is going on. Hey, just, just look right behind you right yeah, now. Right look behind right you. behind you. Hey, that's the adults going on yeah. right now. So you can just let let your kids go. I know you want to watch the kids. You want to see what up. You want to see what's going yeah. on. Don't worry about that. They're going to be fine. Adam, you know, they, the they got it. They got Brent, it. Dave, they yeah. got it. They got, they got, they got those got kids it. on lock. Yeah, on lock. In a good way, by the way. Yeah. And just, just turn around. Just, just turn around. jump in that one right there. Shoes. You're going to have as much fun as your kid, by the way, yeah. if not more. By the Plus, way. you're going to have something in common with your kid. Oh, yeah. In your, and I'll tell you what. If you don't, your kid's going to be beating you. Is is going to be beating you up. <laughs> <laughs> then that's gonna suck. Yeah. Hey, the kids grow up. Mm-hmm. My kid's fifteen. My boy is fifteen. Yeah, you better watch out. Yeah, and we want. Uh, I think there's a secret part of us, if not overt part of us, that wants our kid one day to like question you, stand up to you, maybe confront you about some stuff, some questions they have about you and your whole thing. Yeah, you know, I got asked that the other day. It's like, no, oh, didn't it? Didn't it really make you mad? Because the story in Dichotomy Leadership about the patches, right? The Patches. Yeah, patches on. I told the guys no patches, and Leif and Seth made patches anyways, and brought them. And this guy's like, "Wouldn't it? Weren't you like offended? And weren't you mad?" And I was like, "No, actually, I was kind of thinking to myself, well, cool. These guys have that little rebellious streak that they need as leaders to tell the man yep. to stick it to the man. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't offensive. They weren't doing something that was going to get someone hurt or killed. Yeah, they were. They were just being little rebels." Yeah. Which is fine. So, do I want to see that with my kids? Yes, I want to see a little right. bit. At least a little Sometimes bit. I need to keep that in the chair. Oh yeah, big time. So, if you're not doing, doing jujitsu and your kids are, especially if it's a boy, well, no, girl, boy, whatever. Oh, yeah. That the probability of them standing up to you maybe a little earlier than you expected is very high. That's what I think. That's my hypothesis. Well, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah. It will be a bad thing if you can't do anything about yeah, it because you're not been prepared. training. Yeah. Kids get good. Kids yeah. get good fast. Yeah, it's it's funny because you get these kids right who really get into it, then they grow up into adults. So the belt system is kind of, it's like it's like planting a seed before the the, the plant goes above ground. There's mm. a lot that goes on underground, right? Mm-hmm. So some you know some plants, you know the bamboo thing. Anyway, there's a there's a, what do you call what do you call this limericks? I don't know. Either way, there's an old school story about the bamboo. Mm-hmm. It takes like a bunch of years when you plant it. But once it breaks ground, it takes it shoots mm-hmm. up super fast, right? That's how kids are with jujitsu. So oh, it's a you metaphor. put them in, a metaphor yeah, it's a metaphor for jujitsu. But they, that's an old common story they say as a metaphor. Anyway, so you put uh, the kid in jujitsu, they really like it, and kids they get the belts. Though what are their belts? White, and then you have these intermediary yeah, bi- white, belts now. Gray, that, yeah. yellow. The main ones are yellow, white, yellow, orange, green. Gray has become a main one now too. Gray okay. has become legit. Yeah. Okay, so. You get up to green belt. That's essentially the the purple slash brown belt of kids. The green belt. Interesting. And then you can't get a blue belt until sixteen. Sixteen. Traditionally. Tradition. So once you reach blue belt, you're essentially a black belt for your body. That's it. Your body is like in, right into puberty or whatever. Here's the thing. With no, I don't completely agree with you. Okay. No. So yeah, I dig it. I, I hear what you're saying, but wh- to your point, usually ten years to become. A black belt around if yeah. you're training hard and all that and what you're saying is a kid could start at five and mm-hmm. now 16 gets his blue belt he's mm-hmm. been training for 11 years so mm-hmm. to your point yeah. his skill level could be very very high yeah so that's a yeah you're right and me I'm, I, I got into the story so yeah. I said black belt may be irresponsible either way when he hits blue belt that's not a normal adult blue belt. oh no that is a uh, kick-ass blue yeah, belt that's a killer so he's gonna go Oh yeah, for yeah, my first time fighting his blue belt. I'm 17 years old, and he's beating everyone. Yeah, Super easy yeah, too, by yeah. the way. And these are adults, 25, yeah. 26 years old, and he's just beating them. So he gets his purple belt right right away, unless he's in one of these situations where they actually make you be blue belt for two mm-hmm. years. You know, sometimes there's yeah, yeah. that. Like I think IBJJF yeah. does that sometimes. Competing wise, anyway. 
anyway, when they when they reach ground, meaning adulthood, when they reach above ground, like mm-hmm. the bamboo, they just shoot because all their fundamentals are like yeah. dialed, like well, super they sharp. Have, they've developed like a whole proprioception, yeah, uh, and body understanding, yeah. and it's proprioception not just of their own body, but of their opponent's body as well. Like they yeah. know where your, their opponent's going to be, yeah, which is <laughs> legit, yeah. Yeah, so man, big get on the path of jujitsu. Jujitsu, yeah. the overall concept that we're getting at here. Yeah, and yeah, it's very jujitsu heavy, I think, today. But you know, I haven't really been training that much. So either way, oh yeah, jump on the path. You're gonna need a gi and a rash guard. So people ask, where do we start? Where do I go? Where do I go to get a gi? Go online, mm-hmm. originmain.com. Boom, gis are plenty. Pick whichever <laughs> one is right for you. They are all made in America, by the way. Mm-hmm. Which you know. It seems like common knowledge, but let's say this is your first introduction to OriginMain.com. Boom. Now you know. Get a gi, get a rash guard, jump on the path to jiu-jitsu. Just jump in. Yeah. Usually the first class is free, by the way, most places. Yeah. And a lot of people ask, hey, any advice going to my first class? Just go, keep an open mind, have fun, relax, do all those things. Yeah. A big one is like, Keep your ears like open, you know. Yeah. Don't don't be that guy. Like you always say this word. Don't be the guy. Be like, what if I just do this? Oh, you know, yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, 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 like yeah. what? If it doesn't work. If you just oh, go in, just listen. God. Just listen. And, and, and go. I'm hard to annoy. I think that might be starting to annoy me a little bit <laughs> yeah. when people. I'm talking to a big group of people that have never done jujitsu before, and someone throws out the like. Well, hey, what if you know? What if they just grab your arm right here? It's like, well, there's 14 other moves that you can do from that, which right. I didn't get to because I'm trying to teach you this fundamental thing over here that you don't understand because right. you're an idiot. <laughs> and so, Bro, idiot. Yeah, yeah, and that's the yeah. I would say that. Just keep that in mind. That's the advice. If you you know, if they yeah, ask, what that's do a good I do? one. Keep your ears open. Same. Keep. I, I don't want to discourage people from asking questions, yeah. but let's just let's just think about how we ask the questions, yeah. right? Don't ask it as a challenge to the canon of jujitsu knowledge, which is the way some people ask it. All you have to do is this. It's like, no, actually. If you say like, hey, sometimes he's doing this and I don't know what to do yet. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to tell you and I won't be annoyed at all. If you tell me, if you say it to me like you just uncovered the secret key of jujitsu, I'm going to be slightly annoyed. You won't know it, but I'll just be like, oh yeah, well, here you go. Here's what you do. Yeah. So, Actually, you mentioned the key to defeating jujitsu. You mentioned it what a few it? times. Run away. Oh, well, yeah. That's yeah. it, 100%. Yeah. Nobody can submit me if I'm running unless they're faster than me. True. Running is a good self-defense. Yeah. Hey, also at Origin, we got we got some supplements at Origin. Yes. And we got Joint Warfare, which will help you train every day. We got Krill Oil which will also help you train every day. And those kind of complement each other. They, yeah, very much. They very much complement. What I didn't, the whole mental, like curcumin, <laughs> yep. curcumin and krill oil, this big like massage for your brain and getting everything, so anyways. <laughs> so try those, Those we get great feedback on those all the time. Also got the discipline, which is for pre-mission nutrition. Mm-hmm. When you need to do something both cognitive and physical, we got your back yeah. on this one. Uh, three scoops we've determined is kind of the limit, in my opinion. Is yeah, it, yeah, I think it's kind of the limit. Currently, yeah, I would say that. Sure. Have you ever taken like the old school pre-workout thing yes, before yes. jujitsu? Oh no, no, no! Okay. I don't take this sh- stuff before jujitsu. I, I've done that before, and it's horrible. Yeah, it's like the wrong, wrong move. Yeah, I think if you because your your heart's beating, you're all yeah. amped up. It's just not good. Yeah. you can't think straight. You yeah. know, discipline is not like that at all. Yeah. Three scoops will get you right in the zone where you want to be. Oh, yeah. And, but I think I haven't tried four scoops because I just think it would be crazy. <laughs> But I think four scoops would start to lean towards too much, yeah. too much. Yeah, and and that that's the case with most things, right? Where it's like, oh yeah, two scoops is better than one, and it's true. Three scoops even better than two. Dang, that's true Nine too. Scoops. And then that's kind of <laughs> it. No, yeah, you can't do that. That's most. No, there's things. a dichotomy. You yeah. gotta find the balance. You gotta find the balance. The, gotta find the, the balance. Yeah. Uh, Mulk. We got mulk. Mulk is mulk. Protein milk. Milk yeah, is milk, milk has is protein milk. in it. it. We have multiple flavors now. We have mint chocolate. We have peanut butter chocolate. We have vanilla gorilla. We have the darkness 
just straight chocolate. Yeah, which is surprisingly good, by the way. Why is that surprising? Are you surprised still right now well, about milk? Because yeah. I am not surprised at all anymore. Well, put it this way. I'm not surprised in the capability that it took to make it taste good. I'm not saying that. That was the hardest pe- one to make. Yeah, it took see? us a long time. We went through iteration. So so if it surprised you, I guess I take that back. Yeah. It, it is surprising how good it is because it's good. Yeah. It's really good. Because it's like easy when you think about it. You're like, okay, chocolate mint. Mm, okay, good. I mean, th- as far as making that taste good, I'm not going to be that impressed because, come on, it's mint chocolate. Let's face <laughs> it. It's good. Mint or, or chocolate peanut butter, same deal. Yeah. Man. In fact, I isn't it weird, though, as as good as those flavors are, how come it's so? How come it's been until now that someone could actually make them taste the way they're supposed to hey, taste? Man, I, you I, should be more impressed know. than you are. Yeah, you know, now that you break it down like that, sure, I think you're actually right. I didn't think of that. I just consider you're so obvious but peanut butter and anything in my opinion Brad, it's gonna make it taste good but if you're gonna try to hit me with the straight chocolate on something with protein that's good for you yeah, that low in sugar I'm like yeah okay I'll give it a chance low in and sugar surprisingly one good. gram yeah uh, I was we went out I went to eat with my fam sure hell yeah and my, we were talking about we were just talking about food and, sure. and my daughter was like, well, sometimes she's like, you you just eat like one meal and then you just have like nuts and milk. Because <laughs> cause I do. I eat nuts. I, I get the big giant, uh, what are they called? Cans of sure. mixed nuts. Oh, yeah, mixed out of the container. And I have some, yeah, contain, container. big container. Yeah. And I have just have like a handful of nuts. <laughs> I'll, I'll put some of them in a bowl and then I'm just doing that and milk. And that's when you can't use the peanut butter milk, in my opinion. Too, too much, much, too much nuts. Peanut, <laughs> get, you nuts get too nuts. Yeah, bro, I dig it. Um, I, I don't agree, but hey, I dig it, man. Oh, you don't agree that you can do too much peanut butter? No. So, okay. yeah, <laughs> that, hey, it, you know, I had that one of those, you know, those huge things of peanut butter, the biggest one you buy. Yeah, from yeah, the, yeah. It's from the big box this, store. The st- <laughs> stockpile. Uh, anyway, yeah, milk is good. Good now, protein on that one. Now, I'll tell you what. Now, we just came out with Warrior Kid Milk. And you did the right thing. And and truly, this is awesome. And I'll tell you why it's awesome. Because kids need good food. Kids need healthy food, and they're not going to eat healthy food if it tastes like junk. And so we made Warrior Kid Milk. There's a little less protein in it. There's only ele- only eleven grams. There's eleven grams of protein. Sure. For for the kids. There's probiotics, there's vitamins, there's one gram of sugar, which is which is n- not even sugar, it's something else, <laughs> whatever, there's one gram of sugar in there, um, and it tastes awesome. Strawberry and chocolate, the chocolate's delicious. Mm-hmm. The strawberry is kinda next level. <laughs> <laughs> the strawberry is so good, it tastes like someone took the ultra high-end ice cream and made you a milkshake with it strawberry style that's what it tastes like your kids are gonna love it and you're gonna love it that's the problem I mean the problem is it's not a problem the the reality is I've had strawberry milk warrior kid strawberry milk like for dessert three meals in a row right now the last three meals I had strawberry milk every time why is that tastes good and it's good it's awesome for you this is a revolution. I, I'm not going to throw this out there. Like, you like just did. throw this you word out did. there. This is a revolutionary <laughs> thing. But can you imagine? I think this is the first product in the history of the world that I can personally think of. You tell me if you can think of something else. Kay. This is the first product that I can think of in the world that the kids are going to want to have it as much as the parents are going to want them to have it. Dang. I don't know of any other thing like that. Yeah. What what other thing is like that? I don't know. The kids want to have it as bad as the parents, because like the kids want ice cream. Yeah. They want it bad. The kid, the parents don't want them to have it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The parents want the kids to have, uh, the vitamin pill. The, yeah. the kids don't want to have it. Yeah. This is a universal want. Yeah. It's delicious. And it's awesome for the kids. So I'm super stoked because it's cool when kids want to be on the warrior kid path, but they don't have good food easily accessible this is going to replace all the little chocolatey sugary drinks that parents have been forced to feed their young children and poison them no more Dang those days God. are over yeah so get on the milk train yeah milk train and again. get your warrior kids on the milk train as well yeah 
the that strawberry one is funny because I don't when I go to wherever to get a milkshake, I don't get the strawberry. No, 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 no. Neither would I. But I mixed up the straw. You know, I got some. Everyone's excited. Mm. There's been some hype. You know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I'm like, all right, we'll see what up. Me and my son, whatever. Mm-hmm. He's two, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, I mix it up or whatever. And, you know, I taste it. Bro, it, it it's, you know, something will bring you right back. Oh. When you're a kid, the strawberry, <laughs> whatever. Because, bro, that's, I think that's the last time I really got into a strawberry something. Yeah, like but, as a ooh, child. brought me right back, man. Right back. And well, then, there's yeah, the ready-made strawberry milk that you used to get when you were a kid. Yeah. And let's face it, that that is a whole memory section in your brain that yeah. remembers that it's yeah, looking yeah, yeah. for it sometimes you go into a 7-eleven yeah. you see one of those you're like <laughs> and now that Get like it. i am straight up milk same the strawberry milk right there yeah it's the, the same thing it's it's, it's probably tastes better because it's mm. got a little bit it's a little bit thicker you know it's got a little sure. bit more it's sure. like a milkshake yeah it's a milkshake. we're gonna have to come up with strawberry uh milk adult too with a little bit more protein just for gp because yeah, it's, it's good but in the meantime get that warrior kid strawberry bring you right back. and the warrior kid chocolate's good too it's it's awesome well i prefer the chocolate i'm just saying the strawberry brought me back interesting it was good i like it obviously yeah, my yeah. son well, my son drank most of it but you know he's it, two he's two yes sir how's his how, what's his bicep workouts looking like right Solid. now? Solid. He actually, I have a video of him deadlifting one of the kettlebells, the on it nice. ones. It's, it's dope. Yeah, two. Yeah, good check. form, too. Kids have surprisingly Kids have good form. have naturally good form. They yeah. know what's up. They get broken down over time by society. <laughs> Got to fight against it. Yeah. All right, let's roll. No, what, no, else? what else? Yeah, Moke, good. Uh, also, what? Where you can Moke, you already said that, and that's that. We have our own store, mm-hmm. so that's something. Yeah, if you want to represent, you want to get a shirt, you want to get a hoodie, you want to get a um, hat, a, more rash guards on there, more more specific, direct messages on the rash, rash guards for staying on the path. Go to JockoStore.com. Also, you can get t-shirts because not everyone wears rash guards all the time like John Donaher. Yes. So let's just wear regular Maybe t-shirts we sometimes. You know? Hey, I'm down. Yeah, we, ought yeah, send, yeah. we ought to send John Donner some some yeah, of these things. Can, yeah, but yeah, that's where it is, jockostore.com. Good shirts on there, new shirts on there, by oh, the way. Oh, interesting. Um, Shoot, I've been meaning to sort of send everybody an email, kind of letting them know, because there's a few of them. Mm, I'll do that. Check. Do that. Also got uh, hats. Yeah. For those of you that like flex fit hats, they're available. They're dope. For those of you that like truckers hats, they're also available. Sure. And hoodies, mm-hmm. legit hoodies. Legit. Heavy. Heavy. <laughs> and do we also do we have any Hawaiian on there left? No Hawaiian. No Hawaiian. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah, no, not as of right now, no. Okay. But maybe in the summer we'll make the Hawaiian one again. Yeah, or maybe the the winner for the actual Hawaii people. Oh yeah, true. Got to get it home. Yep. So. That's good. Uh, yeah, some women's stuff on there too, by the way. Some mm. new, uh, some more women's stuff. For the female troopers. Yes, specific. In the house. No specific. Uh, remember, subscribe to this podcast. iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Leave reviews so I can read them. So Echo can read them. But mostly so I can read them. I want the feedback. Yeah, yeah. That goes over there cruising. Well, I get addicted to reading those. Yeah, so after well, a while. when they're funny, they're when they're interesting, but usually yeah. the interesting ones. By interesting, I mean funny. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are good. Very good. Uh, and also, don't forget about the Warrior Kid podcast. Um, nothing but great feedback on the Warrior Kid podcast. People listening to it over and over and over again. Partially because they love it. Partially because I haven't put out enough episodes so we got a little intense time period books coming out and all that but we're kind of getting through that so I'll be able to get back on the path of making the warrior kid podcast As a matter of fact I'm almost done with a story from Uncle Jake good story from Uncle Jake a real big lesson learned <laughs> that'll be on the warrior kid podcast so subscribe to that one as well and don't forget about that warrior kid soap from irishoaksranch.com. We got young Aiden, the warrior kid, running his own business, age 13, making money, making product, made in America, made with goat milk. Yep. <laughs> what else do you need to know other than get some soap and stay clean? Also get the YouTube YouTube videos. Now we are stepping up our game. I know we've been talking about this for a long time. Some of it's just been in the form of harassment, me <laughs> harassing Echo, yes. but we actually, are making preparations training is underway people are coming on board 
things are happening. We're yeah. moving in the right direction. Yeah. And so YouTube, subscribe to YouTube. We're gonna start. Uh, con- we're gonna use that platform even more. Yeah. Get it out there. Yes. Utilizing, spreading good messages to keep people on the path. Sometimes to get people on the path. That's that's a good thing. Psychological warfare. Speaking of the path, a little help staying on the path. Sure. These are little tracks about overcoming your own personal individual weaknesses at one time or another. Yes. So you get that album and you press play in certain scenarios. We're working on assembling Psychological Warfare 2. Yeah. Probably gonna be called All Your Excuses Are Lies. Good. And that one will come out before Christmas. We'll get it to you before Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, we should be able to get it to you before Christmas. Yeah, in time for the New Year's resolutions yeah. as they develop. Yeah, as they develop. Check. Even though you're anti-New Year's resolution. I am. From what I understand. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, just another day to me. No feelings sure. over here on my part. Yeah, yeah. If I, had a, if I was going to make a resolution, you know when I'd start it? Right now. Mm-hmm. Why would I wait? Today. Yeah. No, now. Not even today. Now. <laughs> not later today. No. Not after dinner. No. Get it right done now. now. All right. Well, it can still technically be a, a year's resolution because you could just be like, boom, like from now on for the next year. I get eh, that doesn't really fit. Either way, I dig what you're saying. And cool, man. Do it. Speaking of staying on the path, onit.com slash Jocko. Actually, there it is. On it to stay on it. On it when he when they named it on the path. That's what they had it in reference to. Mm. I know that 100 percent for a fact. <laughs> get your fitness stuff. That's how you stay on the path. You bring the gym to your house. Mm, you said this. It. You said this earlier. I still have a twenty-four hour fitness membership, by the way. Yeah. And I go to twenty-four hour fitness every once in a while. But. But having the this stuff at home will keep you on the path like hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. So get your kettlebells when you do kettlebells. When you do kettlebells, mm-hmm. you do kettlebells. Yes. I do kettlebells. Everyone that I know that's on the path does kettlebells. I'm not saying if you don't do kettlebells, you're not on the path. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if <laughs> you're on the path. And you don't do kettlebells, consider getting kettlebells for your house. And when you do, go to onit.com to get them because they're cooler, in my opinion. That's the only ones I got. Go there. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. Some clothes on there, too, if you want. A lot of information as well. Yeah, onit.com slash Jocko, by the way. It's a good spot. Also, Jocko White Tea. Mm -hmm. Speaking of bringing the gym to your house, (coughs) you better bring 8,000 pounds. Anyway, if you're drinking Jocko White tea, yes, it is proven. People ask me, is that for real? 8,000 pounds? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%. One ton is 2,000 pounds. Yeah. So this four tons, four ton. you will be able to deadlift. And you only have to drink one, too, by the way. I drink the cans. You? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes people say, well, I can only deadlift, you know, 485. And I'm like, drink more tea. <laughs> yeah. I remember. I used to be like that, too. I dig it. But yeah. Hey, it even got Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. Off his, pl- he was plateaued at seven thousand pounds. God knows how long he was stuck there at that weak level. I know. Man. Then he got right up, eight thousand pounds. <laughs> Easy money. Jocko so he's there. White tea. You know what's fu- what's funny about, not what's funny. What's interesting? First episode of this podcast. Oh yeah. We talk about pomegranate chai yeah you say pomegranate chai i don't know whatever tea that you're into because because that was the first one when you made this weird kind of easing into the podcast starting which wasn't really what i had in mind yeah you know uh, yeah. i had more in mind like hey we, okay we press record we start right more and you had hey you know we're cruising over here we'll just kind of be <laughs> well yeah well the podcast has begun now but you as know, a result a little different mindset as a result there's that added layer for the people that did listen to that oh, first yeah. few seconds of that first first episode, you say pomegranate, or we say pomegranate chai. You say no, pomegranate white tea. Yeah, and then it's look at you, look at you day now. Day one, look at you now. Yep, made your own pomegranate white tea. Well, Jocko people white would ask tea. me all the time what kind of tea, and I yeah. wouldn't really be able to tell them because I try would try different ones. No one was perfect, so I just went and made the perfect one. Made your own. Boom. Yeah. That's how right, you do it. There you it. go. We have it on our website too, by the way, jockostore.com. We offer it there, but you can get it anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazon too. Amazon has this stuff. Amazon Prime for the cans. Save yourself a little shipping yeah. if you're on Amazon Prime. Dig it. Then you got that also on Amazon and everywhere you can buy books. We got some We got some books. I got Way the Warrior Kid mm-hmm. and Mark's Mission. Those are part of a series and those will 
those are uh, uh, good books for your children as a parent they how many I don't know how many people have told me this these books have made parenting easier for them because now they just look at their kid and say hey do you think this is a, what a warrior kid would do you think a warrior kid would eat that donut right now? Yeah. I don't think so. You think that warrior kid would leave with the would would leave the room all dirty? I don't think so. And the kid's like, no, no, no way. Mm. I got parents that say their kids say to them, no, a warrior kid wouldn't do that. Yeah. Like when they read Warrior Kid, their voice goes from like, hey dad, what do you think we're gonna do? To like, hey dad, <laughs> sure. I don't think we should do that. Sounds like weakness to me. Yeah. <laughs> Case in point today. So mm. my daughter, she's sensitive. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say thin skin. Well, I don't know, thin skin, sensitive, whatever. So, like, mm-hmm. so if you say something mean to her, as like, an, if if another kid says something mean, that's something to her. You mm-hmm. know, cause she's super nice to everybody. So, a kid <laughs> called her a liar. Ooh, but apparently it's, that's this kid's thing. He uh, just calls people liar. Like, probably got he, a good he, reaction out of it at some point. Something. You know what I mean? No, he got oh, a good reaction out of it, it to some point. Yeah. At some point, somebody acted all crazy, and he's like, "Oh, okay, now now I know how to make people really. Now I know how to get a reaction." Yeah. So. She doesn't like that, you know, because she lying was kind of the thing. My dad always kind of we we would get spankings for lying. Yeah, that's pretty much that's, it. That's a big violation of yeah. the whole thing. The so, code. you know, so as a result, not to say I spank her for lying. I'm not saying that, but she doesn't like the whole lying thing mm-hmm. or she gets a cue. You know how like she'll do something. I'll be like, hey, did you brush your teeth? She'll be like, yes. And I'll be like, and then you go smell you that breath. The truth. And she'll be like, oh, my God, she'll get devastated if I think she's lying. So what, she's, you go, should you go check for a toothbrushes? wet or dry no see i get i go deep i just you want to lie to me we're going we're going <laughs> we're but going see what you did though but see what you do though like if i go and investigate that indicates to her she's fine lack now. of trust yeah like you think i'm lying and she gets really sad so mm. anyway what, what i'm saying is she's sensitive to that kind I of stuff i think she's manipulating you that's a very possible too but Kids it are seems genuine if they're good yeah gotta watch them yes you do anyway so at school she was like hey that's the boy he called he calls me liar and a, another day he called her a liar every day. Like that's his name. Like you're a liar every day. Oh, okay. And so one of my things, not to go too deep into it, I tell her, hey, you're a nice person. So you be nice to people whether they're mean to you or not. So you're just a nice person. Mm-hmm. You don't like become a mean person because they'd be mean. And she goes, well, I really don't like to be called a liar. I was like, would you rather be called a liar or plate face? And then she started laughing <laughs> because she remembers that's how he gets over it. Yeah. He laughs at himself, calls yeah. himself plate face. You know, Nathan, he's over there. He's all kind of laughing, confused, like, oh, that's funny. And they laugh about it. Then they slowly become friends. Yes. So she was like, boom, wait, let's bother. That was today. And I'm not even joking. That was that's today awesome. when I dropped her off. Awesome. So that's Way of Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. We also got Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. This is the book that what's great about this one, people tell me, I read two pages every day. I read three pages every day. I wake up in the morning and read one page. Get yourself on the path. Get your mind right, as my boy Meth used to say. Yep. Up in Yosemite. Dig it. He hit me up on Twitter, by yep. the way. I'm going to track him down. And so that's Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. Christmas time. Good gift for someone. Yep. You want to put someone on the path? Cool. Get him that book. Don't even say anything. Don't even, don't even introduce it. Just give him that book and yeah. just let it, let it ride. Because yeah. when you open it up, you're gonna open it. You have to open it up because yeah. it looks, it's not normal. Yeah. And when you open it up, you see that's not normal either. It's not just a bunch of like black print on a white page. No, no, it's different. Yeah. So you start flipping through it, then you start saying, "Wait a second, this makes sense to me." <laughs> and then the next thing you know, you wake up, and it's not. 742 yeah. it's 448 <laughs> Dang, 742 is still pretty good I think yeah, yeah, it depends on who you no, are I guess not. so that's the, <laughs> that's the discipline equals freedom field manual after that well not after that but the first book extreme ownership this is a book about combat leadership and you got the dichotomy of leadership which just came out dichotomy of leadership by the way by the way extreme ownership number five right now on the Wall Street Journal business books list. Dang. The number one book on that list is Dichotomy of Leadership. Dang. So thanks to everyone for getting those books and much appreciate that support. I already talked about Mikey and the Dragons. It's coming out. It's coming out on Jocko Publishing. So if you want it, order it. Right now it's just up on Amazon. So go to Amazon. Go to, go to Jocko Podcast. You can click through. 
and get Mikey and the Dragon. Some people are having a little trouble finding it. It's there. Get it. Also, Echelon Front, this is our leadership consultancy. We solve problems through leadership. It's me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke, Flynn Cochran, Mike Sorelli, and also Mike Bahama. Don't call a speaking agency. We don't like that. <laughs> Just email Echelon Front, info at echelonfront.com, or check out our website. Muster, San Francisco, sold out. Um, the only good news I have for you is that there will be more musters. Pay attention. I'll put the word out through the social media or whatever. Also, EF Overwatch. This is connecting special operations veterans and leaders and combat aviation veterans and leaders to companies that need experienced, proven leaders that understand the principles of extreme ownership. Go to EF Overwatch to get in that game. And if you wanna keep cruising with us, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. Keep it wild. <laughs> Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink, and thanks to everyone out there in uniform. Thanks for your sacrifice and your vigilance here at home and abroad as well. We know what you do every day, and we thank you for it. And to everyone else, remember the words of Keith Douglas, to trust anyone or admit any hope of a better world is criminally foolish, as foolish as it is, to stop working for it. So keep working for it. Do your part every day to become stronger, faster, smarter, better, to try and make the world a little bit better. Keep working for it and keep getting after it and until next time this is echo and jocko out